Hello and welcome to what will be a very involved discussion concerning Robert E. Lee, the Confederate general and legend of the South. What prompted me to research more about Lee is the recent destruction of the bronze statue at Charlottesville. I think contrary to what the intention was of the people behind that destruction is that I then went away and despite not being American, I felt very invested in terms of reading more about Lee. And one of the wonderful things about being able to speak on this channel is the fact that I am able to go away and find motivation to research topics and present to you whilst also at the same time teaching myself. I find that a very uh, rewarding format, especially when it came to this topic, because Contrary to what you might expect, there is actually a very rich and detailed historiography regarding Robert E. Lee after the first century after his death, so up until the, uh, the 1960s and 1970s, certainly what you would not expect given the current dialogue surrounding him. In terms of finding a, a subtitle for this conversation, I thought perhaps titling him the Southern Napoleon, but on further reflection, that did, did Lee a disservice. Um, not only was Lee completely uh, juxtaposed to Napoleon in terms of his personality, uh, Napoleon was ambitious, domineering, and Lee was very much a conciliatory and deferential sort of character, in addition to being a decent human being, which I can't really say that about Napoleon. But also, I would say Napoleon had far more advantages throughout many of his campaigns than Lee ever did, which makes his military career all the more remarkable. So I've instead focused on the more conventional and mundane, seemingly, subtitle of The Marble Man. The Marble Man, of course, was a contemporary description of Lee in terms of his countenance, his self-control, uh, his physical presence. He was five foot 11, six foot, which was quite tall for the time, um, his military heritage and bearing, but also the fact that as the marble man and referring to the Charlottesville statue, Lee has transcended simply being that of a military figure or a Confederate general and has become a political icon in both equal reverence and notoriety, all the more reason to focus on Robert E. Lee and why I personally have been very attracted to the figure of Lee and this conversation, considering the fact I I seldom ever discuss generals or military figures. They always have to have some political aspect to them and that's incontrovertible when it comes to discussing the life and legacy of Robert E. Lee. Um, I went away and I came up with some general thoughts, which is my way of an introduction in terms of how I'm going to tackle the subject of Lee beyond looking at his military record. So please bear with me for a second. More so than representing the cause of Southern separatism confined to the legacy of the Confederacy, in Lee, the lost cause has many implications. Lee's reluctance to abandon the US Army, his paramount loyalty to Virginia, and his efforts at post-war reconciliation permitted for the elevation of Robert E. Lee to that of a national icon rather than a mere Southern icon. Lee harkens back to the antebellum USA, the USA prior to industrialization, a period when states' rights prevailed over the encroachments of the federal government. In this respect, Robert E. Lee is a fundamentally romantic figure. He is a spiritual successor to George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, all of whom were Virginians, and perhaps the man who fought the hardest to preserve an antique America. Combined to his Virginian particularism and Anglo-ethnocentrism, Robert E. Lee is nowadays condemned twice over. He is antithetical to the statist, socially interventionist, and racially diverse America of FDR and Lyndon B. Johnson. As we become further removed in time from that antique America, it is now ubiquitous to associate Lee with the defense of slavery to the detriment of all other factors. As the USA has evolved into a propositional nation, the presentist redefinition of the Founding Fathers' original intentions casts Lee as the enemy of liberty and of the Union. 
To put it bluntly, he is a traitor. To those who promote the 1619 project, wherein slavery is placed as the central motif of America's historical narrative, this antique America becomes the era of America's original sin. Lee was a defender of that America. Yet what is his most egregious sin? It is that Lee was a fundamentally decent and virtuous human being. His decency serves to legitimate and perpetuate the lost cause. And that is why I believed he has been consigned to the flames. Now, my guest here has been very patient in terms of allowing me that uh, that introduction. And of course, it would have been very odd for me to begin this investigation in Lee without having an actual southerner with us to um, offer his perspective. So I'm very fortunate to be joined by Charlemagne today. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much for having me on. I'm very excited for this opportunity. This is actually a great opportunity for me as well, uh, despite being a southerner uh, by many generations. In fact, uh, I'm shamefully undereducated on the Civil War and Robert E. Lee himself. And I actually do have uh, some familial connections to the Civil War. Uh, I am an eighth cousin of General PGT Beauregard, uh, which is fairly distant, but, uh, you know, blood runs deep in the South. Um, so for the stream, I took it upon myself to read the entire Douglas Southall Freeman biography on Robert E. Lee. So I've come about as prepared as I can. I've done my duty in that regard, which, uh, you know, Mr. Lee himself would uh, certainly appreciate. Um, unfortunately, much as uh, <laughs> perhaps we'll talk about Providence a bit in this uh, stream, uh, Providence has ordained that uh, you, you've lost your uh, lieutenant, Mr. Prudentialist, for this venture. Um, so unfortunately, we'll be missing um, his contributions. Uh, but much like uh, Lee himself uh, lost his uh, <laughs> Lieutenant Jackson. So I'll try to fill in as the uh, analog to Longstreet here and hopefully do a better job. Um, <laughs> I very much hope you do a better job than Longstreet on the stream. But um, anyway, um, thank you very much, uh, Charlemagne, for being here. Um, in terms of like getting this started, then I think we'll just we'll just go straight into it and um, discuss Lee's background and um, family history and the period of um, Lee getting up to the American Civil War and. Charlemagne has been very industrious and gone ahead and read the entire four volumes of the Douglas Southall Freeman biography. Um, I have to confess that I have the abridged version here, but nevertheless, I'm going to be reading various excerpts from the abridged version uh, as we continue on this stream. So I want to pass this off to you first, Charlemagne. Is there any sort of prevailing opinion you have or quick summary you want to offer regarding the origins of Robert E. Lee? Well, he comes from, um, you know, uh, American royalty or uh, prestigious families, if you'd like to put it that way. Um, his um, He comes from the uh, Carter family on his uh, mother's side. Um, or sorry, he met his children are descended from uh, Washington as he, he married Mrs. Carter. So this is getting ahead of myself, actually. Um, but he's he comes from Light Horse Larry, who is his father, a famous uh, colonel, or was he a general? I think he was a uh, Light Light Horse Harry. Yes, he was. Um, he was a Sorry, colonel. Sorry, Larry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, Light Horse Harry. I told myself I wasn't going to do that. Light Horse Harry was a uh, colonel in the um, in Washington's army, and he was. Uh, he wrote a memoir. He he uh, you know achieved quite a bit of prestige in his time. Ultimately, unfortunately, Mister Harry um, ended up uh, dying ignominiously uh, in poverty and in somewhat of a shame. But uh, Mister Lee himself uh, certainly inherited the better parts of his father. We could say um, he moved around a bit as a child. Um, uh, originally, I think when he was at the age of a mere two, they moved to uh, Alexandria. Um, and, you know, in his early life, uh, I, I would say the most critical part of his early life is, is his time at West Point, obviously, um, which, uh, you know, started the foundation of his military career uh, at which, but perhaps we're getting a bit of ahead of ourselves there. Uh, yes, I just want to um, uh, to, to offer uh, um, some other points um, regarding Lighthorse Harry in particular. Um, 
partly because Light Horse Harry's relationship with George Washington almost mirrors that of Robert E. Lee's relationship with Winfield Scott. Um, Light Horse Harry was a beloved cavalry commander of George Washington. Uh, they were both from Virginia. Light Horse Harry, in fact, was a delegate to the Continental Congress from the state of Virginia. And indeed, in the 1790s, he became a governor of Virginia. But Light Horse Harry's career is very controversial in the fact that, as you say, um, he fell under rather ignominious circumstances. Uh, he got into a huge amount of debt. He spent a long time in debtor's prison. Um, he then had a radical sort of ideological shift in the 1790s. He went from being a Jacobin apologist of the French Revolution. He wanted to go off and offer his services, almost like a, a Thomas Paine to the revolutionary government in France. And then later in his career, he had a road to Damascus moment and he became a federalist. Uh, during that time, the main distinctions were Jeffersonian or Democrat, as existed then, and federalist. And what distinguished Federalists in terms of their international policy is their allegiance towards England. And so for that reason, or rather their um, amiability towards England, and for that reason, he opposed the War of 1812, so much so that he actually became crippled when attempting to defend a Federalist uh, a newspaper editor from being attacked by a lynch mob during the War of 1812. And uh, that is why um, he fell out um, of Lee's life very quickly and went off essentially to the Caribbean and then to uh, to die in Florida. Um, you, you mentioned Anne, Anne, Anne Carter Lee. Essentially, Lee is... He's, he intercepts three very interesting families. There are the Lee family, of course, which have this venerable lineage regarding their involvement in the Revolutionary Wars. In fact, Robert E. Lee was only the, uh, he was a le he was a son of a second marriage. The first born son of Light Horse Harry um, became a Jacksonian. He got a, uh, basically a tourist commission to become the uh, American consul in Morocco. He then attempted to seduce his wife's sister and again died in, uh, in disgrace abroad in France. So after that, Robert E. Lee essentially became the standard bearer of the, the, the legacy essentially of Light Horse Harry. Um, but, but again, it's not just the Lee family, it's the Carter family, and then it's the Custis family, the family of his wife, um, Mary Custis Lee. And you can see here the image of Arlington House. He starts off in Alexandria, he moves to Arlington. In terms of just imagining where these places are, um, because again, I'm not too familiar with the geography of Virginia. Um, Arlington and Alexandria are just across the Potomac from Washington DC itself. Indeed today, you can say that it is part of the general Washington metropolitan area, which is far beyond that of DC itself. In fact, Arlington and Alexandria are very close to Mount Vernon, which of course is the resting place of George Washington. And Mary Custis Lee uh, fought essentially to preserve her relics from George Washington. So in terms of trying to find a venerable military legacy and also a political dynasty to attach to all of those big names during the revolution, um, I think it's fair to say that uh, Robert E. Lee to say that his um, legacy and his uh, lineage is distinguished would be an understatement. Yes, he comes from a, a heritage from Washington on his father's side due to his father's military service. And then, of course, he marries into the family um, itself um, through his wife. And yeah, I've actually stood, uh, I, I've been to Arlington House and um, at Mr. Lee's former residence, um, you can see quite clearly uh, the Capitol building or the White House itself if you uh, really peer through the metropolitan area that's there now. But back at the time, it would have been quite clear. Um, so it's it's very eerie standing at Arlington to just sort of teleport yourself back in time and imagine uh, what it would have been like to look down on Washington from Arlington itself in, in the 1860s. 
Um, so yes, the we'll get into this later, but many of the battlefields we're going to talk about and Richmond itself, the uh, capital of the Confederacy, is very close to Washington. So all of this takes place um, in uh, close proximity to the capitals of, of both countries. Um, and the, the fact that Washington is sometimes potentially under threat as well due to this will uh, play into some of the uh, maneuvers that uh, Lincoln undertakes on the Union side of the war as well. Um, but yes, I suppose uh, getting back to uh, Lee's early life, um, I don't have too much to add at this point other than when we get to uh, his education at West Point. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say on his father? Uh, no, I, I, I don't want to say really, really any more on his father. I mean, his father represents a lineage and legacy, but he doesn't represent much in the form of a formative experience on Lee, due to the fact that Lee, again, was far too young. I mean, uh, his father was incapacitated when Lee was four, so much of his upbringing is response is uh, the response had did become the responsibility of um, Anne Carter Lee. So yes, by all means, um, would you like to take us away regarding his uh, military education at West Point? Yes. So yeah, just to close that out, uh, Harry Lee uh, died absent um, his son as well. So in, in the last few years of Light Horse Larry's uh, life, he wasn't even present uh, for Mr. Robert E. Lee. I, I suppose actually Freeman does point this out. Um, Robert E. Lee sort of had an affi affinity for for women his entire life, not in a um, uh, uh, what would we say a uh, adulterous way or anything like that, but just uh, he he enjoyed the company of women, and perhaps this has to do a bit with uh, his dependence on his mother more so in his upbringing. At least uh, Mr. Freeman, you know, suggests that might be the case. Um, in any case, uh, Robert E. Lee did uh, receive entry to West Point. Uh, his entry into West Point uh, was a result of many, many letters of commendation that were sent on his behalf um, from everything from congressmen uh, to people he knew in his, his personal life and his, that his uh, familial heritage was able to uh, get him into contact with. So, um, so Mr. Lee was sort of... Um, you know, he, he was sort of blessed in this way. It, it's not a, a, a free entry into West Point. Everything that was written on his behalf was a genuine reflection of his, his, his very good character, uh, you know, being an upstanding gentleman at his age and everything like this. Um, so Lee was actually accepted into West Point, um, where I believe he had a career of four years, um, if I recall correctly, was the, the term at West Point for the students there. Um, so you started out as a cadet and you made your way basically through a normal college education uh, to become an officer in the Union military uh, or the <laughs> just the U.S. military, we should say at that point. And um, well, Mr. Lee was never at the top of his class in any particular uh, field of study, except for a few exceptions. But in general, he found himself very highly marked uh, only behind two or three students the entire time. And he dedicated himself uh pretty much entirely to his studies. He did not get involved in uh, drinking. In fact, I'm not sure he ever drank any significant quantity of alcohol his entire life. Uh, he received zero demerits through his entire stay um, at West Point. You know, he was basically a model student in every capacity uh, you could possibly expect, not in a sort of a nerdy way, but in the sense that one does their duty, um, you know, in, in the service that he's committed himself. So really from the very beginning when he was first entering into adulthood, Robert E. Lee uh, committed himself wholeheartedly uh, to his studies. Um, the particular studies he went through included, uh, you know, algebra, geometry, calculus, uh, what we now call physics, uh, the French language. And he studied other things in his spare time. Um, he also studied the campaigns of Napoleon, um, he read the work of uh, Germany or Hominy, the Swiss uh, military historian uh, who wrote some seminal works on military strategy um, at the time. Uh, let's see. Anything else you'd like to add to that rundown? 
Uh, no, just um, one point, I think, as reflective of US and Virginia society in general, in order to be admitted to West Point, you needed to, I believe, get a recommendation from the Secretary of War. So to enter into West Point was a distinct privilege, it required a certain social position. And this is another point I want to bring uh, into context regarding Lee is that Lee and his family and his wife's family, the Custises, were very much planters, the closest um, thing that America had to a landed aristocracy. And I do mean that in an almost literal sense, in the sense that aristocrats derive their power, position and wealth from the land. And the fact that in the case of figures such as Lee and his family, and bear in mind that his nephew, Fitzhugh Lee, and his son, Rooney, will become prominent generals in the Southern armies in their own right. This is again reflective of the fact that in addition to deriving one's position and wealth from land, one serves the nation by committing oneself to military service. So this is the background of Lee in terms of trying to establish his particular pedigree and his upbringing and his position within the broader sort of planter social context. But regarding Lee in particular, I mean, it's interesting to see how diverse his subjects are. I mean, on the one hand, he was a voracious leader. On the one hand, he was talented with foreign languages. In fact, later on, uh, he would be an early advocate for trying to introduce Spanish um, onto the regular list of subjects because of the obvious advantages conferred when fighting the Mexicans. Uh, in addition to even being invested in painting and drawing. So you can say that within the context of the officer elite at West Point, uh, he was a jack of all trades. And I think something that Freeman really tries to emphasize is that he can't deduce the motivations or thought patterns of his historical subjects, the limitations of being a biographer. And he chides those who attempt to involve themselves in what is effectively pseudo-psychology. But nevertheless, he does opine, and uh, I would say one of the strengths of his biography is to focus on the various formative experiences of Lee and sh explain how they shape the man that he would ultimately become and the man who could commit himself uh, with great valor and along when it comes to the campaigns of 1862. And this should all be illustrated in his upbringing. And something else I want to point out regarding Lee before we go further is that from a very early age to Lee in his 60s, with the exception of his severe conver conversion to Episcopalian Christianity in the 1850s, I would say that Lee, unlike someone like a Napoleon, never has a fall from grace or uh, becomes a tragic figure in the sense because Lee doesn't have a fall from grace. He seems to be a very consistent personality and character from his upbringing up until his death. Uh, just some broad reflections as it pertains to Lee. But uh, I, in terms of sort of setting off the conversation from here, what I find interesting is that almost in contrast to what we see with Lee in the Civil War, he then specializes in topography and engineering, and he begins his career in the army as a military engineer. Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, well, his entry into the engineers is critical to how the battles in the Civil War that he commands plays out as well. Um, he, yeah, he developed an interest in engineering very early on. Uh, perhaps I should uh, actually read some of the, some pieces from the letters sent uh, to the Secretary of War on his behalf. So uh, W.H. Fitzhugh wrote, uh, the young gentleman whom I have now the pleasure of is her, uh, his mother's, youngest son, an intimate acquaintance and a constant intercourse with him almost from his infancy authorized me to speak in the most unqualified terms of his amicable disposition and his correct and gentlemanly habits. Um, later on, uh, we have from one of his teachers uh, from his youth, uh, W.B. Leary, Robert E. Lee, or Robert Lee was a 
formerly a pupil of mine. While under my care, I can vouch for his correct and gentlemanly deportment and the various branches to which his attention has been applied. I flatter myself that his information will be found adequate to the most sanguine expectations of his friends. With me, he has read all of the minor classics in addition to Homer and Longinus, Tacitus and Cicero. He is well-versed in arithmetic, algebra, and Euclid. In what in regard to what he has read with me, I am certain that when examined, he will neither disappoint me or his friends. And there are innumerable letters uh, basically stating just as much. So he was well, very well regarded uh, by all of the his elders at the time and received, you know, really just glowing recommendations from everyone. Uh, and then in his final graduation from West Point, he also received uh, a total of 1966 out of 2000 possible credits, which is uh, very high. And yes, as you say, he went into the engineering corps, um, which at that time is basically involved in setting up fortifications. Um, let's see, some of the other studies he had at West Point would have included uh, artillery classes, the higher levels. Um, Lee was one of his weaknesses, um, however, was actually in using cavalry. Um, he, he never really had any cavalry experience in his career up until the, the Civil War itself. Um, let's see. So shortly after he graduates from West Point, I believe is the time at which he gets married. I'm just looking through the chapters here. Um, anything else to say on West Point? Uh, I, I, no, not on West Point. And thank you for that, Charlemagne. I, I just want to clarify something in the chat. This is something I didn't want uh, to say, but I, I thought it would be inevitable. We are not defending slavery on this stream, as, as ridiculous as I have to point out. My opinions on slavery are completely irrelevant to this stream. This is focusing on Lee's perspective and Lee's opinions on slavery, which we're going to get into later. The fact we've chosen to study Lee is not simply because he's become ubiquitous to the cause of slavery. In fact, that's why we're trying to entertain this subject from a more nuanced and more objective perspective than is the perspective that we're given, unfortunately, today. So please, can we move beyond that? Thank you. Sorry for that, Charlemagne. Yes, no problem. So following his uh, graduation from West Point, he, he begins his courtship of uh, uh, Mrs. Cust or at the time, Miss Custis. Um, let's see, around 1830, I believe, um, is when he uh, began his courtship with her in order to end in marriage. Uh, let's see, he was in the Army Corps or the Corps of Engineers. Uh, at the time, during his time in the in the core, um, unfortunately, he found himself frustrated uh, for about the first five years of his career, um, moving about the country quite a bit. And, uh, you know, the United States was not involved in any military action up at the time uh, at the time until, you know, we get to the Mexican War, which we'll discuss more later. Um, the period. Uh, the period between um, West Point and the Mexican War, we saw, you know, Lee get married uh, to Miss Custis. Uh, Lee began to study his ancestry more, um, both the lineage and also his father um, and his campaigns with Washington. Um, I don't have too much to say on this period. Um, well, I mean, it's remarkable, actually, considering how much time he spends away. I mean, he's mm -hmm. al almost permanently on commission from the 1830s up until 18 up until the 1850s is that he has seven children during this time uh other than being invested in his lineage and ancestry he is a huge family man and the fate of his children his daughter and stepdaughter in particular are going to um compound the tragedy of lee at various times but he's he's invested in engineering projects during this time he comes yes and, um, actually um Sorry to interrupt, but I just uh, recalled one of the most significant ones. So I'll get to the the St. Louis project. Um, so at some point, he's uh, he is sent um, to the city of St. Louis to deal with an issue um, regarding the 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 river, uh, the Mississippi River, which passes through St. Louis. And basically, there's an issue where the the harbor is being filled with sediment because 
the Mississippi, uh, you know, changes its course over time and sometimes splits off entirely. And basically natural processes are resulting in the, the harbor around St. Louis being filled with sediment and that's going to become unusable. And this is a serious problem for the city. So this is probably one of the earliest examples of re Lee really excelling with limited resources and the pure grit and will to succeed at his task, regardless of the obstacles put in front of him. Um, so in St. Louis, there's a there's a buildup of uh, silt that turns into an island several hundred yards long. It's called Duncan Island. And then there's another island in the middle of the Mississippi called Bloody Island. And basically what, what he's tasked with doing um, by the federal government is diverting the Mississippi River by, by the construction of dikes around St. Louis in order to wash away uh, Duncan's island. And unfortunately, the weather and the funding and the labor available to him um, is not really suited to the task. Um, he has sort of multiple operations he has to undertake, both uh, working upriver um, uh, in the uh, area where there are rapids and also building the dikes themselves. And Lee himself actually um, goes out to the site and works, you know, in the in the the, the um, you know rather intense weather with his crew in order to build these dikes be, because he has such limited resources available to him the, the federal government simply won't um, fulfill his request for for more funding in a timely manner but he, he more or less becomes a local hero to St Louis because despite the limitations placed on him uh, he actually manages to build uh, at least one of the dikes that he intended to which buys time for St. Louis and actually washes away a large part of the sediment that have built up in St. Louis's fort. There's also uh, St. Louis's harbor, sorry. There's also some uh, contention here because St. Louis lies on uh, state lines as well across the Mississippi. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think this was a really interesting part of his early career in the engineers just because of the amount of, uh, the amount of sheer dedication and commitment to the task that has been set before him uh, by the the government, and he manages to succeed it succeed in it uh, much as he does later in some of his battles in the the, the Civil War. You know, you can really see um, you can really see the character of the man who will lead the Army of Northern Virginia in this particular project uh, in Missouri. I mean, it's very easy given the you can say the desire to be invested in military campaigns that this is almost a job for a bureaucrat um but he handles it exceptionally and it's one of the first projects in which he does take command he has control over resources he gets involved with the actual construction alongside his men and other than that we just have to talk about the inspection and the uh, fortifications from Savannah, Charleston, York, etc. Again, his commission as being a member of the engineers. But we get to the American-Mexican War. And I think just before we get into it's just a series of battles, I think we'll speed this up a little bit, if that's OK. Mm -hmm. um, do you have anything to say regarding the relationship between Lee and Winfield Scott. Winfield Scott, for people who don't know, was the commanding general of the United States from 1841 until 1861. Um, he is essentially the commander in chief uh, during Polk's presidency in terms of conducting the war against Mexico. And for that reason, he's seen as one of America's greatest generals. Well, uh, yes, as you say, um... Lee worked on, Lee was sent around the country working on fortifications uh, before his involvement in the Mexican War, uh, which he did an excellent job at as well. And he got a lot of on-the-job experience there with fortifications. In regard to Mr. Scott, I mean, Mr. Scott's uh, style of command, Lee basically sought to emulate, which was more or less to uh, give general strategic orders and give your uh, lieutenants the discretionary um room to make determinations in the field as to how exactly those orders would be carried out. So Mr. Scott himself was an enormous influence on the style of command that Lee would ultimately adopt for the Army of Northern Virginia um, for the entire duration of the war. So this is a very, Mr. Scott had a significant influence on General Lee in the capacity in which uh, Lee observed him. 
Uh, and yes, the campaign in Mexico, um, it, Mr. Lee was involved in, not in a command capacity, but again, uh, as part of the uh, army engineers, um, although he did get combat experience within that war. Um, and yes, I think now we can get into discussing that campaign itself, if you'd like. Yes, I mean, what transpires as a result of this campaign, Lee, funnily enough, he's very slow to promotion. By the time we get to the Civil War, he is only a lieutenant colonel, um, which, given his advanced age and his experience, is rather remarkable. But such was the size of the US Army and such was the... Um, uh, <laughs> essentially, the... Um, the long list of people ahead of him in the American hierarchy and the command made it impossible for him to um, obtain rank quickly. But he does relatively during his career as a result of the war in Mexico. Um, he ends up being a, I believe, a colonel or a major of the junior rank. He establishes himself as one of Winfield Scott's um, favorite officers due to his quick ability to appraise the uh, geography, especially when it comes to the attack on Mexico City and the fortresses surrounding it, um, allowing armies to pass through treacherous routes and being able to rout the force of the Mexicans. Um, in terms of his sort of first major military experience, it's setting up artillery for the very speedy conquest of the Mexican port city of Veracruz. And that again is why it sort of inspires comparisons with Napoleon and his experience at Toulon. Um, Nevertheless, what really should be emphasized again here is Lee is serving under a general. He is not commanding this. His operation involves setting up superior artillery fortifications against a inferior military opponent. All of these advantages that he would not have at the time of the Civil War. So again, just to illustrate as we try to build up this picture of Lee, um, his ultimate adaptability when it comes to his level of experience. Yes, and during the Mexican War, um, you know, Lee, the, the, the relevance of his schooling and engineering shows itself because this, as you said, involves setting up artillery positions, which involves reconnaissance and an understanding of the land. Lee really developed uh, the skill uh, and aptitude at looking over a landscape and identifying the key positions that one would want to hold in order to uh, have the, um, the, the best possible position, either for defense or for setting up artillery batteries. Uh, and also he became skilled personally in reconnaissance. Um, he would go out on missions himself and there's actually uh, one particular story that's very interested, interesting, and and just to sum it up, uh, you know, effectively Lee is scouting uh, near a river. Uh, uh, I think there was one other person with him, um, although he might have been no, no, no. He had gone with a Mexican guide, and I believe he had went down by himself to the river, um, and left the guide further back. And then some Mexican soldiers come up to the river. Lee has to duck under a log, and he actually sits uh, or, or lays under a log, I believe for several hours while the Mexicans are right around him and he could have been captured at any moment. Um, so suffice it to say, Lee has a lot of personal experience, uh, both in, in from that incident and other, in other capacities during the Mexican War, doing uh, active reconnaissance in the field. Uh, so Lee, his real expertise is understanding the landscape and how to use a lot, utilize it best uh, for military purposes. And he gets a significant amount of experience doing that in the Mexican War. If not commanding troops, he certainly learns how to maneuver troops uh, through observation and how to set up positions for troops, uh, and particularly uh, uh, how to execute uh, you know, flanking attacks on opponents that are in fortified positions. I, I believe it was uh, Cerro Gordo where one of these most uh, significant attacks took place. In, in terms of, and thank you again for that, Charlemagne, um, there's another aspect to this, which is his personal sort of heroism. And you can say his, the physical demands on his position as an officer, in addition to being able to find these routes and being able to create maps which are of military use, relying on local knowledge and guides, and that ability essentially to act as a, um, a conduit between various officers at the front lines and behind the lines, being able to communicate with soldiers fighting and soldiers strategizing. Um, 
there are times where he's not sleeping for three days. In fact, it's the only recorded time, I believe, that he actually fainted as a result of his physical overexertions in terms of being able to go back and forth on the battlefield. And this is something which will also play as a major factor when we get to the Civil War as well. It's just the amount of personal travelling uh, that Lee is involved in, in terms of um, being able to coordinate all, the, all of these various attacks. He's doing so in the position of a... Uh, a lieutenant officer, not in terms of a position of command, but that aspect of him is never going to um, leave him. And also the fact that Lee is consistently on the front, Lee is open to attack. And again, this should play into um, Lee's aspect of personal heroism. But again, his experiences in topography, his experiences in engineering, setting up artillery positions. But of course, this also involves um, experience of offensive warfare. But again, as I want to illustrate, using American troops, artillery, superior firepower against a weaker, beleaguered opponent. Indeed, Lee and his officer corps and the troops serving under him were a professional army, whereas Santa Ana's forces in Mexico City were essentially unwilling conscripts. Santa Ana lost so many armies that he essentially had to train troops and raise armies repeatedly, whereas the United States could rely on this core of exceptional officers and professionally trained men. So it's no wonder that Santa Ana lost that war and the American session of the East, which involves, I mean, Texas had already been confirmed as independent and then joined the United States at this point. But as a result of this war, the America, America gains California, uh, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, essentially the entire southwestern portion of the United States. And of course, we don't need to exaggerate how significant that is in terms of the territory development and conceptions of manifest destiny. Moving beyond the Mexican conflict, because he never had any direct experience in command, he had established brilliant, he established many relations with figures who were going to play an important role in the future fighting during the Civil War. In addition to Winfield Scott, he actually um, is able to appraise the military capabilities of one McClellan, who is going to, of course, be a major figure during the um, uh, campaigns against the army at the Potomac. But after this, you can say, distinguished career in which he has everything going for him, he then almost, um, you can say, drifts towards retirement by the 1850s. He becomes the superintendent of West Point. So in that sense, he is directly responsible for the education of new cadets. And this is going to be interesting in terms of looking at his post-war career, in terms of his experience um, regarding training recruits, getting to understand the um, process of education, sizing up new officers who are going to be coming into the armed forces, inculcating a broad uh, sweep of education, which of course is going to facilitate his own role and his own ability to communicate with his various troops. And in addition to that, when he is actually decommissioned as the superintendent of West Point, he spends many years going around America essentially on court-martial duty hearing court cases of um, various soldiers who, of course, have been positioned before a military court. So all of his experience regarding this is in positioning fortifications, understanding the significance of terrain, education, diplomacy between various officers, and the legal system within the, within the military police, etc., None of this would necessarily suggest itself for a career as a successful frontline commanding general. But nevertheless, that is Lee's career up until this point. But in terms of, again, talking about Lee as networking, despite the lack of a promotion, uh, one of the most noteworthy connections that Lee makes during his career as the superintendent of West Point is, of course, Jefferson Davis, who during the early 1850s was the Secretary of War. Yes, that's a very good point. Um, that's certainly the most important connection he made during his actual brief tenure as the superintendent of West Point. Um, so, yes, following the Mexican War, um, you know, just to cap off the Mexican War, he he did sort of intermingle with many of the famous commanders uh, you'll hear about later in the war, such as Grant or Beauregard. But it should be said that he only briefly 
encountered or served in the vicinity of some of these people. So in Mexican War, he did not really develop any sort of deep understanding of any of these figures that he might later face in battle. I think his career or the portion of his career where he was involved in the legal system is of a bit of interest because later in the Army of Northern Virginia, um, Lee himself was extremely judicious in terms of the dispensation of justice. And I have to imagine that his career, uh, the portion of his career participating in these courts martial uh, certainly must have played into his view of how military justice is dispatched. Uh, you know, during this time as well, uh, the Lee estate began having serious issues uh, with their financial situation. Uh, Lee also became confirmed in his Christian faith. Um, you know, he's a low church Christian. We should point that out. Um, certainly had no casual relationship um, with God throughout his life. But it wasn't until the 1850s, uh, sort of at the, uh, you know, what looked like the retirement of his uh, military career, did he finally declare the uh, get confirmed in his faith. And yeah, as you say, there's, there's really nothing stellar about his career in terms of seeing him as ending up in a position that some might analogize to, you know, Napoleon or something like that. Um, you know, this, this is, this is a military colonel, um, whose promotions have, you know, been delayed. He spends many, many years, a colonel. It seems like he may never make it to general, uh, you know, there are no wars on the horizon or anything like that. And by the looks of it, uh, he may simply retire um, as a colonel. He, you know, as you say, he expresses the sentiment at times as well. It's interesting that that Lee is never really, uh, I guess, what you would call like a hardcore military man. It's it's the career he chose, the one he served in dutifully. But strangely enough, throughout his life, and even at the end of his life, he's, I think he said the uh, the worst decision of his life was to go to West Point, basically. Um, so he never really viewed himself as necessarily being some sort of great general, anything like that. It's just the career um, that he found himself in, you know, partially due to his heritage from uh, Light Horse Harry. So, yeah, after the Mexican War, um, things are really not going well for uh, Mr. Lee or even the Lee family in general in terms of their financial situation, especially with the death of uh, Mr. Lee's father-in-law, Mr. Custis, uh, which causes some problems in terms of settling the debts of the estate and uh, distributing the uh, distributing the inheritance to the, the appropriate uh, children. Um, and uh, furthermore, um, liberating the uh, slaves of the estate as well. Um, so serious problems for Mr. Lee uh, after the Mexican War, just in terms of his career really no going nowhere, you know, being made to travel the country uh, and keeping him away from his growing family, uh, participating in these courts martial, and yeah, the financial straits they find themselves in. So th this is actually fairly, uh, I guess, common among southern families like these southern aristocratic families these landed aristocrats you mentioned it's no easy task keeping these estates running um you know uh, the wrong situation could find yourself uh, too deeply in debt um and just the fact that you owned you know thousands or hundreds of acres of land uh did not make you uh, a rich man uh, mr lee actually never really found himself, uh, certainly never found himself a rich man. Um, sometimes uh, they were quite destitute. And, you know, he learned to live uh, in a very simple way himself in order to really for all of his life, uh, which helped greatly in dealing with these conditions. So we, we although we can think of Mr. Lee um, as a landed aristocrat, uh, we shouldn't really think of Mr. Lee as being a particularly wealthy, um, as he, he certainly was not. Um, anything you'd like to add to that? Well, no, I, th I think your your comment regarding not particularly wealthy, I mean, that can characterize about 90% of the aristocracy, whether it be the uh, the planter class within America or the European aristocracy. And I think Lee is obviously a great example of that. Um, keeping the Arlington, Arlington estate together, you can say was Lee's passion after about 1857. To put this in perspective, in 1857, Lee is 50. He's still only a lieutenant colonel. His main du duty revolves around court-martial duty. There are no military prospects on the horizon, no prospect of promotion. And so he decides probably quite wisely to invest all of his time 
into his family, into his estate, into managing the fallout from the will of Mr. Custis, essentially retiring to that of the life of the gentleman farmer, coincidentally very close again to the place where George Washington decided to settle down, um, both after his career as a revolutionary general and after his career as being president of the United States. But of course, in the case of Robert E. Lee, with none of these significant accolades and without even the credit of having one major battle in which he himself was the commander, he was a, a very much valued lieutenant. He was a valued officer. He had made ample connections between other military officials, politicians, and of course, Winfield Scott, lest we don't forget. But there is no indication at all that by 1860, this man is going to end up being the legend and the icon that he later becomes, uh, which, if anything, makes him all the more interesting. Before I, I get into that, and really as a conclusion to this aspect on Antebellum Robert Edward Lee, um, I have from the Freeman abridged edition a a summary, essentially, of the skills he'd ascertained and the position he was in. Though I want to emphasize that Freeman is not the sole source of this. I've taken myriad information from various other sources in terms of larger sources. I have a more recent biography here from Michael Corder, which was put out a few years ago. And I have a summary of Lee historiography by Thomas L. Connolly. So I don't want to give the impression that this is uncritical. It is not in any means uncritical. Nevertheless, I will say that with the benefit experience that um, I found Freeman, despite the antique quality of this book, which was written in the 1930s, um, is very erudite, and I think it earned its reputation as being the seminal biography on Robert E. Lee. He was then 54 years of age and stood 5 feet 11 inches in height, weighing slightly less than 170 pounds. In physique, he was sound, without a blemish on his body. In the whole of his previous life, he had suffered only one recorded illness, and that had not been severe. Without having the bulging muscle of bovine strength, he was possessed of great powers of endurance. When he was past 40, he had even competed with his sons in high jumps at Arlington. He had skated and danced, and he had been an excellent swimmer. His vision and teeth were fine, his hearing was unimpaired, and his voice was rich and resonant. Few men were the inheritors of a stronger nervous system. In appearance, one fellow traveller who saw him that April day considered Lee the noblest-looking man I have ever seen. His fine large head was broadly rounded, with prominent brows and wide temples, and was set on a short, strong neck. His hair was black, with a sprinkle of grey. His short moustache was wholly black, brown eyes that seemed black in dim light, and a slightly florid complexion gave warmth and colour to his grim face. His mouth was wide and well arched, his lips were thin, a massive torso rose above narrow hips, and his large hands were in contrast to very small feet. Sitting behind a desk or on a horse, his shoulders, neck and hands made him appear larger than he was. His finest appearance was when he mounted, for he was an admirable rider, with the flat legs of an ideal cavalryman. And of course, we shouldn't need to emphasise his relationship with Traveller, which is his essentially is to Lee what Bucephalus was to Alexander. His manners accorded with his person. In 1861, as always, he was the same in his bearing to men of every station, courteous, simple, and without pretense, of objective mind, free of any suggestion of self-consciousness. He was considerate in his dealings with others and of never failing tact. He made friends readily and held them steadfastly. Close relations never lowered him in the esteem of his associates. He was clean-minded and frank with his friends, and confided in them more freely than he had been supposed. Always he was unselfish, talked little of himself, and was in no sense egotistical. Although he was slow to take offence and was not quick to wrath, his temper was strong. Except when he was sick, he rarely broke the bounds of self-mastery for more than a moment. Then he was best left alone. The company of women, especially of pretty women, he preferred to that of men. In the presence of the other sex, he displayed a gracious and sometimes a breezy gallantry. But no suggestion of a scandal, no hint of over-intimacy, was ever linked with his name. His conversation with his younger female friends was lively, with many touches of teasing and with the occasional mild pun, but it was not in any sense witty. He had a good sense of humour, 
which his dignity rarely permitted him to exhibit in laughter. In dealing with children, his manners were at their finest. For them, he always had a smile, no matter where he met them, and won their confidence almost invariably. His manners reflected his spiritual life. His was a simple soul, humble, transparent, and believing. Increasingly, religion had become a part of his very being. Creed, however, meant little to him. Reading daily his Bible and his prayer book, spending much of the time on his knees, he believed in a God who, in his wisdom, sent blessings beyond man's deserts and visited him on occasion with hardships and disaster for the chastening of the rebellious heart of the ungrateful and the forgetful. In every disaster, he was to stand firm in the faith that it was he was sent by God for reasons that man himself could not see. Self-denial and self-control were the supreme rule of life. It was the basis of his code of conduct. He loved good food, but he was ready to eat, thankfully, the hardest fare of the field. In the confused councils he was doomed to share, he borne the contention of the braggarts and the swaggerers with self-control because it was his duty as a soldier to be patient and his obligation as a Christian to be humble. He had built up a dislike for tobacco, which he never used, and a hatred for whiskey. Wine he drank rarely, and even then in small quantities. In intellect, he was of an even higher order than had been demonstrated in the 32 years of army service, without a single failure to his discredit. His mind was mathematical, and his imagination that of an engineer. The best of his results always were attained when originality and initiative could be employed. Routine officer's duties bored him. His culture was wider than that of most soldiers, well-grounded in Greek and in Latin, he kept some of the spirit of the classics when he had forgotten the texts. French he had mastered when he was in the first full vigour of mind. For Spanish, he had an enthusiasm born of belief in its utility. Of some phases of American history, he had a measure of precise knowledge. Fiction he avoided, but poetry he enjoyed. He delighted to look at a sunset or a garden. Birds were in particular care to him. His own contribution to physical beauty was through the promotion of orderliness and implanting of trees. Outside his profession, his chief interests were agricultural and social. The ideal life, had he, had he been able to fashion it, would have been to entertain or to visit pleasant people while riding daily over a small plantation. As for society, he learned more from men than from books. All manner of acquaintances were his generals, professors, planters, politicians, engineers, and laborers. In those two unchanging fundamentals of military service, discipline, and cooperation, Robert E. Lee had received the precise training of a professional soldier. Obedience to orders were part of his religion. Adverse decisions he had schooled himself to accept in the same spirit as approval. He could elicit the support of his superiors without flattery, and in the few instances where he had ever had subordinates, he had won their allegiance without threats. He was a diplomat among engineers. Fully qualified to deal with the politician in executive office, he was suspicious of him in the field or in the forum, though he was meticulous in subordinating himself to civil authority. His dealings with his brother officers had never been darkened by scheming or marred by jealousy. Familiarity with the history of war was his in limited measure. The American revolutionary campaigns he had surveyed carefully. Napoleon was a great captain whose battles he had carefully followed. To the Crimean War, he had devoted at least casual study. With Hannibal and with Julius Caesar, he was not wholly unacquainted. From these masters of war, and most of all from General Will Winfield Scott, he had learned the theory of strategy, and had learned it well. He had participated, too, in nearly all the strategical preparation of the most successful series of battles ever fought prior to 1861 by an American army. The strategical function of high command he had learned from those battles in Mexico. That function, as he saw it, was to develop the lines of communication, to direct the reconnaissance, to ascertain the precise position of the enemy, and then to bring all the combatant units into position at a proper time and to the best advantage. Thanks to Scott, he had, a far, he had far more than the staff officers approached the duties that awaited him. In reconnaissance, his experience had been sufficient to develop great aptitude. He was an excellent topographer, and not without training as an intelligence officer. He had been something of a what sea power meant. Fortification he knew thoroughly. 
Such was the positive equipment of Robert E. Lee. It was the best equipment with which any soldier entered the struggle. So obviously I thought that was a very concise illustration of Robert E. Lee, the man, as he's approaching his mid fifties. Um, but before I get on to the reasons in summary, as it pertains to Lee for his own decision to side with Virginia and later the Confederacy and the causes of the civil war in more general or the war between the states, uh, do you have anything to say, Charlemagne? Well, uh, I recall that uh, chapter in the book that what you just read is definitely one of the best summaries of Lee's career up until the point where the civil war was about to break out uh, in 1861. Um, that part is uh, in the chapter on a train to Richmond. Um, you can actually, I found the first volume of the book on web archive. If anyone wants to review what you just read and is interested in, in citing it in the future, um, you can find that around page 450. Um, but in any case, yes, I mean, there, there, there's so much there. I mean, one of the things you covered is his relationship with children. I mean, there are many scenes throughout the war where he'll stay with various families. So he always entertains, entertains the uh, family's children most delightfully, uh, which is always a, a great mark of a, a gentleman. You know, his relationship with uh, women, always playful, um, never adulterous, teasing. Um, you know, he was not... Uh, uh, a book nerd or anything like that. Most of his, his experience came from his dealings with men. He's not a person who dedicated an inordinate amount of time to reading military histories or anything like that. Um, uh, there's, just, there's just so much to cover there. Um, you, yeah, we, you mentioned his, his humility. I mean, one of the things Lee is really known for is any case where punishment has to be dealt out, um, he's most judicious any case where someone can be saved from embarrassment he'll do his utmost to avoid any situations like that i mean his his humility is is practically boundless his his ambitious his ambitions are are not what you would imagine for a man who ultimately ended up as something of a um a warlord um in his own capacity um yeah i don't i don't think i can really add anything to that summary of Lee, it's, it's really perfect. Um, and uh, you have, I guess in a sense, the, the order of the book is written. We have gone ahead a little bit because at this point, when that chapter is written, he has actually resigned his commission in the United States military. Um, shall we now? Yes, get, yes get exactly. This? Um, this is, this is the question of Southern secession, but obviously I think for our own benefit as well as the people listening to the stream, I think it's better to have a, a perspective as to why Southern secession happened and why the Civil War happened, because obviously the the argument given is not sufficient in terms of understanding this conversation or understanding Lee, which is slavery. So when the United States got involved in the Revolutionary War, and it's something, this conversation regarding Lee and the events in Charlottesville are rather serendipitous, because I've been trying to think about the relationship to the states and that of the broader British Empire and the implications of essentially ethnocentrism, etc., and the original intention of the founding fathers and their conflicts with the crown. And this actually plays into that same discussion. The Articles of Confederation, which was the constitution that preceded the current constitution of the United States, very much conceived of the states essentially as sovereign entities in loose alliance with the others. Um, due to a multitude of factors involving a prodigious press campaign led by Alexander Hamilton and James Madison, um, we arrive at the current United States Constitution. But within the United States Constitution, that aspect of this weak alliance between fundamentally sovereign states is given more cohesion, it's strengthened, but at the same time, that is its core essence. Within an aspect of that, there is this idea of balancing the powers of populous states, northern states, with that of southern states. Looking at Virginia in particular, and why I believe Virginia in the case of Lee is so significant in terms of understanding this discussion, southerners tend to over-index in terms of the upper echelons within the United States. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, even James Madison, Andrew Jackson, etc., etc., etc. All of these figures came from the South. So 
In terms of understanding that the original American constitution was not democratic, it focused on the sovereignty of states, and the idea of parity between the states was a way of preventing it essentially devolving into mob rule or consolidating into a unitary state such as as existed in Europe at the time. In many ways, you can say that was the example the Americans did not want to follow. And of course, there is the aspect of slavery everywhere sort of south of Pennsylvania, which will expand further into the West. So means of ensuring this parity between the states and state sovereignty were achieved through the creation of the Senate, the Senate by which every state, regardless of size, had two senators. Then you have the creation of the Electoral College, which is a system of indirect election to distance the office of the presidency from individual voters instead of it becoming a plebeian institution effectively. Such were the measures to neuter the effects of the uh, House of Representatives, which was to represent the popular vote. Then you add to that elements of the three-fifths clause, which was by way of representing the vast slave populations within the southern states, which represented about one-third of the population, albeit it varied from state to state. The three-fifths clause in artificially inflated the numbers of southern representatives within the House of Representatives to avoid, again, them being dominated by northerners within their legislation. So it should be clear from understanding all of that, that compromise between the states and ensuring some level of parity, even though they're clearly unequal halves, is a key feature of antebellum United States. To my mind, this continues, but there is a major complication here, which is the expansion of the United States westwards. The major expansion westwards actually comes with the original treaty in 1883, whereby Britain recognizes American control all the way up until um, modern day Illinois, which was not featured within the concept of the original 13 colonies. Then beyond that, you have the Louisiana Purchase, which you can actually see on this map, extends the United States forward with all of those barely inhabited possessions which had been under French and Spanish control periodically up until then. On top of that, you have the annexation of Oregon County, and then you have the Mexican-American War and the Texas War of Independence. All of these territories are now aligning themselves with the United States, and progressively, they are being adopted into the Union as new states, with all the implications that has for the delicate makeup of the balance between southern states, slave states, and the northern states. In terms of compromise, we have the presidency of Monroe, and we have the Missouri Compromise, whereby there is an understanding that for every slave state that's created, two senators, there is going to be a free state also created, two senators. But of course, the implications of the system are put to the test when you see state after state, such as Kansas and Texas, um, being incorporated into the republic, such as the whole nature of expansion, whilst attempting to maintain a union, which is fundamentally that of sovereign states, whilst creating new states into what has essentially become a more imperialistic project, manifest destiny expanding out into the West. Um, but before I get into the 1850, Charlemagne, what do you think of that appraisal regarding North-South relations? Uh, well, very good. Um, one thing we should add is we've talked a lot about, po we're getting into politics now. In that summary of Lee that you read just before, one thing you'll notice is that uh, there was absolutely no mention of an interest in politics. Uh, Lee himself was very much actively disinterested in um, the field of politics for, throughout his entire life, um, and especially after the war, uh, avoided it altogether. So all of these political problems um, are entirely above Lee's head. Lee commits himself entirely to the rightly constituted authority um, at all times throughout his life and never becomes personally involved with any of these issues. As to Southern secession itself, um, I mean, what the you know, obviously slavery is the main issue of the Civil War period. Um, you know, we we need to be clear uh, about narratives here. Um, you know, Lee himself did not fight um, at the head of the Army of Northern Virginia to preserve slavery or anything like that. He fought um, to the duly constituted authority of his state of Virginia. Um, when he was leaving Texas, actually Texas seceded while he was still in Texas um, on 
some I, I forget exactly why he was there at the time, but oh, he was he was there overseeing the construction of several new forts along the um around Saint Aust around Austin, I believe. But yeah, of course, and uh, he actually barely makes it out uh, past the uh, Union forces because Texas has seceded and started seizing all of the federal property, and the uh, Union troops are now being kicked out of the state. Um, but uh, well, they're they're also trying to you know prevent uh you know the the new confederates from seizing their property as well so lee actually barely slips past the union who are also on their way out of the state um someone asks him uh colonel do you intend to go south or remain north i'm very anxious to know what you propose doing Lee responds, I shall never bear arms against the Union, but it may be necessary for me to carry a musket in defense of my native state, Virginia, in which case I shall not prove recreant to my duty. So Lee Lee himself is carried along by Virginia, and he's very clear about this after the war when, when asked, uh, although he doesn't speak uh, about the war very often at all. Um, Lee goes with Virginia. Virginia decides, although he doesn't uh, support or believe in this right of secession even, Lee actually uh, thinks that the Union should be preserved, and he's not pro-secessionist. But once the constituted authority of the state of Virginia, uh, his home state, leaves the Union, he views himself as being necessarily carried along with that. And there's really no choice involved uh, in that capacity. Um, so... Yeah. Um. Yes, I mean, on the one hand, you have the authority sort of vested in events, the the un the un sort of incomparable hand of providence, which of course he defers to. You have the authority of the U.S. Army and the federal government, and then you have the sovereignty of the state of Virginia. All of these things are factored within Lee's decision, and I think it should be plainly obvious that Lee. His decision was predetermined by the situation in Virginia, as you correctly say. Uh, whether Virginia or not was part of the Confederacy or part of a broader alliance. I mean, Virginia could have been invaded by the South, and he probably would have fought alongside Virginia on the same Ab lines. Absolutely. That needs to be made clear is, is that Virginia seceded but didn't join the Confederacy. Um, you know, this is how it went with you know, basically all the states. The secession and joining of the Confederacy are two separate things. And he was simply going to fight with Virginia. Um, once it has seceded, that was you know, pretty obvious that it was going to become de facto part of the Confederacy, but he was never a Confederate in that capacity. He was always a Virginian first. Um, and so in regards to the, the map you have on the screen, one thing we should make clear too in regard to the politics is, is the whole question of, you know, how the Civil War started. Uh, in the United States, we're, we're taught in our, you know, grade schools that it was basically the bombing of Fort Sumter uh, by the forces under PGT Beauregard. This is not true. Um, mm. the, the, for one, there were no casualties on either side. Uh, fort Sumter, for those who don't know, is a fort off the East coast of the United States, um, that in the South, obviously that came along with the, uh, Confederate territories when they seceded and the union or federal forces, uh, refused to evacuate, you know, sensibly, eventually the Confederates bombard them, uh, particularly when it appears they're about to be reinforced. There are no casualties on either side of this bombardment. And this is often pointed out as like the first opening shots of the Civil War, which you can you can definitely view them as the as the opening shots of the Civil War. But the war itself was already uh, underway at that point because Abraham Lincoln, you know, had given the uh, Virginia and the other Confederate states uh, 30 days. I forget the exact date, but basically he gave them a month to restore federal property or be invaded you know at this point when when lee was leaving texas as i mentioned texas had already seized federal property this is already an act of war so the war really began well before any shots were fired and it certainly yeah. wasn't due to the bombardment of a single fort uh could i could i go back slightly then come yeah. back to the point of fort sumter because that's a very important point you raised there a pervading feeling in the southern states is that of a conspiracy among the Republican Party in particular and the Northern abolitionists to subvert the Constitution to enforce the abolition of slavery, which in turn would mean the imposition on the South of a federal authority. That was a fear, but it wasn't necessarily borne out. Nevertheless, there were many sort of steps in that direction. 
and you can say controversial regarding this. I mean, what I find most fascinating about the conceptions of America as a white ethno state, as representing essentially the ancestry of the the English, the Dutch, the Scottish, and later on the Germans, etc., is the contrast between Dred Scott versus Sanford which essentially confirms that in 1857 as a Supreme Court ruling. And then we have the 14th and the 15th Amendment 10 years later. Within the understanding of the Constitution before the 1850s, slaves were not considered part of the evaluation for citizenship and thereby the rights bestowed by the Constitution. The idea of the extension of slavery into the West was carried on through the Kansas-Nebraska Act, whereby popular sovereignty was to be the key aspect of whether a state would become a slave state or a free state. And of course, this simply meant that pro-slavers and pro-abolitionists would go into states and they would attempt to whip up support for one faction to make it either a slave state or a free state. And of course, this caused a huge amount of friction between the abolitionists and the pro-slavers. But when Abraham Lincoln is nominated as a presidential candidate for the Republican Party, he advocates against Dred Scott versus Sanford and on the prevention of the expansion of slavery into the Western states, not the abolition of slavery in total, that really needs to be emphasized, but on the restriction of slavery into the Western states. The reason why the Southern states who were emphasizing the idea of state sovereignty and by extension, therefore, the preservation of slavery believed this was a conspiracy was because the creation of states in the Midwest and Western America, as indeed would transpire, would give the free states an absolute majority in the House of Representatives and the Senate. Indeed, when you look at the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860, it was an election carried off without the need to appeal to a single southern state. The Democrat Party, even in that election, was divided between Dixocrats and Northern Democrats at the same time, which essentially ensured that Abraham Lincoln would win that election. So the pervading feeling in the South is that the Republicans are going to come in and they are going to strangle the prospect of ensuring longevity for slavery through, you can almost say, a political encirclement of the Confederacy, but significantly not instantaneous abolition of slavery. So really, one shouldn't be looking at slavery simply as the cause. However, it is a serious contentious factor, as should be plainly obvious. Regarding the attack on Fort Sumter, what is fascinating, if you look at this map, this map really is quite revealing here. The attack on Fort Sumter was on, I believe, April the 15th, 1861. Look how many more states join the Confederacy after seceding after that point. The Union, essentially Abraham Lincoln's diktat, once he is inaugurated and then orders the uh, states in rebellion supposedly to stand down, actually reinvigorates the cause of secession and the cause of the South to the point that Virginia in particular, in what is a far more contentious aspect of popular sovereignty, as opposed to somewhere like South Carolina, where the Confederacy project really gets going. Um, it forces these states first to believe they had to secede, and then to join up with the cause of the Confederacy. There are also the implications that given the geography of Washington, D.C. and the federal government, had Washington, D.C., say, for example, been positioned in Philadelphia or positioned in New York, there is, to my mind, a likelihood that Kentucky, Missouri, and even Maryland could have joined in with the Confederacy regarding this um, conception of a conspiracy against the slave states. So all of this seriously complicates our picture, and it complicates the picture for Lee, and he simplifies it by emphasizing the cause of Virginia independence and following the path of the Virginian populace and by extension the Virginia governor, even though, as you can see on this map, the devastating implications. once. Virginia becomes embroiled in the project of the Confederacy, which, as you can see on this map, the core Confederate states are in the Deep South, not on the uh, territories such as um, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Virginia. Virginia. Virginia is in the firing line from all sides, from uh, Indiana and Ohio, to Pennsylvania, to Maryland, to Washington, D.C. itself. It's surrounded on all sides. And very quickly, after Virginia joins with the Confederacy, Virginia is dismembered and West Virginia is carved out of it. So 
this, you can say, at the same time, the motivations for creating the state of Virginia, they imperil Virginia, yet at the same time, they imperil the legitimacy of the Union, given the significance of Virginia to the prospect of the original Revolutionary War, the fact that revolutionary heroes and the founding fathers like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson came from that region. And of course, there is the lingering aspect as to whether secession was legal. And someone has actually pointed out a rather interesting point here, which is that the War of Independence wasn't legal technically either. Um, and this is very much my opinion when it comes to re rebellions and insurrections, is that this is all a matter of interpretation. And unfortunately, when you apply a rather Machiavellian maxim, ultimately, it comes down to force. Yeah, I think the question of legality is kind of neither here nor there. I mean, Lee himself viewed it as nothing less than revolution. We should be clear on that. He did not believe in a right to secession uh, in the U.S. Constitution, um, you know, which is perfectly fine. I mean, my my opinion on the matter is, you know, the 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 secession should have never happened the confederacy was was by far the worst years of the south there's really nothing to glorify in it it was an act of ultimate hubris for these states to secede uh largely you know born out of paranoia and sort of ironically providentially we could actually say the hubris of the south was rewarded with the most humble possible uh warlord to, to fight the war um on their behalf you know not that uh you know, there were there were other commanders and other theaters, but obviously the, the Army of Northern Virginia is, is the critical factor in this war. So, you know, I basically echo uh, Robert E. Lee's opinion on secession. Um, it, it should never have happened. It was really unnecessary. Um, you know, it was born largely out of a, a paranoia from conspiracy uh regarding the north uh, could, could i could i just clarify that opinion i i believe that that is true yeah. but in terms of as you can see with the extension of secession and the confederacy yes it was born out of hubris and paranoia yes i believe there could have been more reconciliation and the process of the abolition of slavery would have taken decades instead of five years but in the case of the northern states i believe what they were responding to was not the attack on Fort Sumter, but on the military declaration by Abraham Lincoln, which in many terms they considered a gross extension of his constitutionally vested authority. By contrast, James Buchanan, uh, who had been the president up to that point, was also a unionist, but he had attempted to maintained the union after Abraham's, link, uh, Abraham's election during his lame duck presidency by means of negotiation. So when Abraham Lincoln comes in, Fort Sumter comes along and the pretext comes along, all of a sudden it is met by a overriding military response. Essentially, Winfield Scott's interpretation was that establish a major military presence around Washington, D.C., and the South will simply lay down its arms. Well, of course, this had the opposite effect, and this actually aided the Confederacy cause by exaggerating the fears of that paranoia in terms of being met by the sword. And even Winfield Scott said this, that I cannot imagine of protecting the Union by the end of a bayonet. This, even among U.S. officers, was an incredibly contentious issue. And you can say Abraham Lincoln, as much as the cause of the Confederates, exacerbated that conflict by going to a military response rather than a long drawn out period of compromise, which could have possibly also resulted in a secession. Uh, yeah, I don't mean to put undue blame on the South, certainly not for the beginning of hostilities. A I, I just make the point that, uh, you know, they never, they should not have seceded from the Union. But likewise, the Union should not have been held together by force of bayonet. Uh, the South should not have been invaded. Uh, should have been dealt with politically. Whether or not the Union could have been brought back together or not, uh, who knows. Um, so, you know, but Robert E. Lee also rightly chose to side with his home state. Because the thing is, once, once secession happens, you know, you don't, you don't turn against your own people. So, I mean... You know, it it kind of is silly to, to even say this to like retroactively support things, but obviously, you know, I give my full backing to the South in a historical perspective because you know I, I side with my own people, uh, even if I think they made a mistake in seceding from the Union. Um, so that that said, secession has now happened. Robert E. Lee has resigned his commission in the federal military. Uh, only 
days before. Uh, just, just one, just one very important point. Because yeah. uh, before we get into the the military history, I mean, I mean, I, I like getting into as much detail as possible. So if the stream goes on for a long time, I, it's not really that much of a tragedy. But we have to talk about Lee and slavery before we move on. Um, I think just for the benefit of ourselves as much as the benefit of the audience. So here I'm reading a letter which was written by Lee. And again, this is um, taken from the Freeman book and he begins with an introduction. In writing to his wife, Lee, of this happy arrival, Lee set down for, his, for the first time, as far as known, his reflections on the slavery question that was then inflaming sectional hate. He had participated in the discussions among the officers at West Point during his superintendency. While he was on court martial duty at Fort Leavenworth, he may have seen at first hand some of the passions aroused in bleeding Kansas, hence Kansas, Nebraska Act and the implications of popular sovereignty. He had been in contact with slavery all his life, though he had never owned more than half a dozen slaves, and they probably had been inherited or given him by Mr. Custis, his father-in-law. He believed in gradual emancipation and had sent to Liberia such of his servants who wished to go. But of all he thought on the subject, that puzzled open-minded southerners nothing of any consequence remains prior to this letter written about seven weeks after the first national election in which the republican party had presented a candidate and this is lee in this enlightened age there are few i believe but what will acknowledge that slavery as an institution is a moral and political evil in any country it is useless to expiate on its advantages I think it, however, a greater evil to the white than to the black race, and while my feelings are strongly enlisted in behalf of the latter, my sympathies are more strong for the former. The blacks are immeasurably better off here than in Africa, morally, socially, and physically. The painful discipline they are undergoing is necessary for their instruction as a race, and I hope will prepare and lead them to better things. How long their subjugation may be necessary is known and ordered by a wise and merciful providence. Their emancipation will sooner result from the mild and melting influence of Christianity than the storms and tempests of fiery controversy. This influence, though slow, is sure. The doctrines and miracles of our Saviour have required nearly 2,000 years to convert but a small part of the human race, and even among Christian nations. What gross errors still exist! While we see the course of the final abolition of human slavery is onward, and we give it the aid of our prayers and all justifiable means in our power, we must leave the progress as well, as the result in his hands who sees the end, who chooses to work by slow influences, and with whom two thousand years are but a single day, although the abolitionist must know this, and must see that he has neither the right or power or operating except by moral means and suasion, and if he means well to the slave, he must not create angry feelings in the master. Though although he may not approve the mode by which it pleases providence to accomplish its purposes, the result will nevertheless be the same that the reasons he gives for interference in what he has no concern. Holds good for every kind of interference with our neighbours when we disapprove their conduct. Still, I fear he will persevere in that evil course. It is not strange that the descendants of the Pilgrim Fathers who crossed the Atlantic to preserve their own freedom of opinion have always proved themselves intolerant of the spiritual liberty of others. Of course, that's a subtle dig given his uh, Episcopalian uh, proclivity, uh, proclivities there. But in that sense, you can almost say he occupies a middle line within the context of the United States of the day. And this is something I really want to emphasize again. Opinions on Lee that exist currently in terms of the pervading mainstream opinion are opinions informed by presentism. And this is something that as a historian, it's one of the greatest sins you can commit in terms of trying to impose modern sensibilities upon historical actors. Within the context of America at that time, that essentially was the middle position between hardcore abolitionists or radical Republicans, such as uh, Thaddeus Stevens in the North, and hardcore defenders of Southern separatism and the maintenance of slavery as an institution based on uh, natural racial hierarchies, etc. Lee obviously believes in gradual emancipation. But in terms of the emphasizing of the abolitionist movement to inflame the relationship between slave and master, his gradualism is essentially that of the defense of a 
civil order, of a social and political order, and to prevent slavery be used as a tool essentially for revolution. In this sense, you can say he's a conservative, almost a Burkean, in regards to his opinion on slavery. And this is also manifestly expressed in his actions. Lee, interestingly enough, in terms of this narrative, is the one responsible for putting down John Brown's raid, which was, again, precipitated by the abolitionist zeal of John Brown. Um, and when uh, Lee essentially occupied the house in which John Brown had been caught and uh, taken hostages in his um you can say uh, irregular attempts to try and uh, facilitate the question of abolition in the South. Lee looked upon John Brown as a madman, not necessarily because he supported the abolition of slavery, but because he represented the violent and revolutionary impetus of the worst of the abolitionist movement in his mind. So as a soldier, and you can say as a Southern gentleman, Lee is focused here more on order. And as he illustrates the idea of progression as per the slow revelation of providence than he is in terms of expressing slavery is wrong. Therefore, any means should be available to destroy to destroy said institution. Do you think that's a fair assessment? Yes. No, I'm, I'm glad you, uh, you, you brought all those points forward because this is very important to talk about. I mean, at least Lee's sentiments are not abnormal for the time. It's not like, you know, again, we have this sort of uh, presentism in historiography. The South is not some slavery forever society. The thing about the South is looking at this map on hand, if you just imagine the gray states as basically one giant farm uh, where life was hard and the the continuation of its economy and civil society depended entirely on the, the presence of slave labor, and simply ripping that to pieces in a haphazard way would utterly destroy the society. Uh, you know, that's that's what these people were looking at at the time. And that's what Lee is basically talking about is that, you know, look, uh, you know, although there were, you know, very pro-slavery sentiments in the South, you know, in general, there was the understanding that this isn't good. We don't like that we've inherited this legacy. Uh, but the fact is, this is how our society is constituted. And in order to emancipate the slaves and actually educate them, which Lee and others were proponents of, uh, this has to be done correctly and not in a revolutionary way. Um, so this this sort of um, historiography we have now where the South is some evil society of slaveholders that are intend to hold slaves to you know the 21st century or something is, is complete nonsense. And most people did not actually believe that. They simply believed in in maintaining their civil society. And, you know, I mentioned paranoia earlier. You know, it's not to suggest that the paranoia wasn't justified by some of the actions of abolitionists, abolitionists in the North. And it should be understood how dependent the South was on agriculture. We're looking at two completely different countries here in a sense. And, you know, literally by the point of this map where, you know, you can imagine the North as the society built around these sort of, uh, cities that in some capacities were like industrial worker barracks where the south has a completely different orientation where it's built around growing crops uh in large part the cotton trade that was you know basically it's only major export to countries like great britain uh so it's it's critical uh, it, again like i said earlier the, the landed aristocrats in the south weren't uh um you know these these sort of wealthy magnates like you might imagine today i mean life was hard and if you take away slave labor you know it's that's basically it. The South is finished economically. And then, you know, views it, it it's viewing itself uh, entirely at the mercy of the North and sovereignty uh, and self-determination, independence, states' rights. These are all very important uh, to the people living in these states and the people governing these states at the time. So this was a critical issue and not something to be taken lightly as just you know slavery is not like some the machinations of, of evil white men or something like that uh yeah of course how could i forget tobacco is the commenter uh, mentioned there uh but all of this all, all of this agriculture was dependent uh on slave labor whether you like it or not and you know at the time uh you know many people did not like it uh but it is how it is right we can't you know, it's the same narrative we see today where you see these radicals insisting that society be instantly reordered in this chaotic way. And, you know, people can see that no good will come of that. And people understood at the time that 
no good will come of you know radically changing the society in order to get rid of the slavery. And again, it should be mentioned that the slavery experience in the South uh, was was very paternalistic and not the sort of horrendous condition. You know, I've been in museums where they show you, you know, slave quarters and things like that. And, you know, we won't pretend that slaves had the best quarters ever, but for the most part, I mean, Southerners were not really living the high life, right? So it's not like slaves were particularly mistreated or constantly whipped or things like that. Um, well, ironically, there should be a disparity between, because there were some cotton magnates, but invariably some Southerners were incredibly poor and the experience essentially here, the, the misconception is that all white Southerners were benefiting from the institution of slavery when in fact it benefited very few. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, most for one, you know, most Southerners didn't own slaves and many who did, such as, you know, Robert E. Lee's family only had, a, you know, a handful, half a dozen to a dozen, you know, well-treated, even some of his slaves who were liberated after Mr. Custis's will was executed. Some of them, you know, gave, he gave his slaves basically the option to go to Liberia if they wanted it. And some of them did and wrote to him, you know, kindly after the war, other of his slaves asked for his autograph after the war. I mean, <laughs> we're talking, you know, we're talking about Robert E. Lee's slaves desiring his autograph after the civil war and, you know, being happy to be able to greet him again. So that should give you an understanding of what the actual relationship here was. Um, so we, we can't envision the North as some, you know, heroic Avengers, you know, ripping to shreds this this great evil. Uh, no, and and <laughs> that is a, a point I really want to illustrate. The abolition of slavery in the South, as we explained, that was not Abraham Lincoln's original intention. But what inflamed that perception was his desire to put down the quote unquote insurrection by military force. Um, this is going to sound really um, stupid, but nevertheless, it's something which I think is quite pertinent here, and I think which. It's actually made me really question um, the Union response. And again, you can tr try to sympathize with figures like Lee and his desire to go with his state. Um, in Curb Your Enthusiasm, you know, Larry David, who is the, the writer of Seinfeld, uh, is at a dinner party. And he's being very politically correct. He's getting to an argument with someone and said, why was it so important to keep the Union together? you know, 600,000 men died. Why was it so important to keep the union together? The opinion is completely verboten, yet at the same time, no one can really adequately explain to him why it was so important to keep the union together. I think this is more interesting in the fact that Abraham Lincoln was not a radical abolitionist. There were far more radical abolitionists in the fringes of the Republican Party than he. And when he ultimately was responsible for initiating the process of the 14th Amendment, it was done within the confines of the Constitution. Nevertheless, when we look at his military order on the 15th, it really looks like his solution, completely in contrast to James Buchanan, was to prevent the quote-unquote insurrection from gaining momentum by a massive display of military force. And conversely, there were many Southern sympathizers in the War Department who would try to sprinkle the South with arsenals, military weapons, caches, um, which were going to be used in the event that the South needed to buttress their own position in negotiations. So again, in terms of going back to uh, Mao Zedong and saying that uh, uh, political power um, comes from the barrel of a gun, both sides understood this. Both sides attempted to use military force as a way of settling this dispute, and ultimately it resulted in a complete catastrophe. And I think that's a good time, finally, to come to Lee and his actions from April the 15th, because it really is quite extraordinary that Lee is now responsible, essentially, for organizing the defense of Virginia, which is on the front lines versus the, uh, the federal forces. Yes, so Mr. Lincoln uh, asks his commander-in-chief, Mr. Scott, I believe, to forward the idea to Robert E. Lee to take command of the Union forces. Uh, well, not much more need be said. I mean, we're, 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 he's, Lee at this point is viewed as the man to lead the federal army um, in this upcoming war. So that should give us an idea of the level of prestige given to him uh, among his peers and his superiors, uh, even if his career doesn't necessarily point to him becoming this sort of warlord. Uh, that said, too, we should be clear to point out, although he had many competitors above him, 
uh, for higher military positions uh, to achieve the rank of general, as you mentioned earlier. In his home state of Virginia, uh, he was highly lauded as, as a great Virginian of um, you know great achievement. And this is the way he came into command of the Army of Northern Virginia, or at the time, just the Virginia's, Virginia's armed forces. Um, so now I forgot what you, <laughs> what did you want to get to? Uh, well, well, this exact point, I think, yes, I, I think the one reason why uh, he was in line to become a Union commander was because of his relationship with Winfield Scott, mm. who was still the commanding general of the United States forces, even though he was pushed out very quickly after um the war commenced. Um, he had offered Lee command of a Union army, which is all the more significant. It, understanding patronage and the system of political elevation and how Lee would actually revile the system, because he was only a lieutenant colonel at this time. Virginia, I, th I believe the US Army created him a colonel, and then Virginia, on its own volition, the governor, created him a major general. And then the Confederacy created him a brigadier general. So all of a sudden, within a year, this lieutenant colonel has been made both a major general of Virginia and a brigadier colonel of the Confederacy. First of all, Virginia secedes. And then I, I believe within a few weeks, it joins the Confederacy. And Jefferson Davis and the Confederate government moves from, I, I think it was Montgomery, was the, the, yes, Montgomery Alabama, Alabama, and it moves to Richmond, Virginia. Richmond, of course, which was the, I believe, the capital of Virginia up until that time. Um, can you think of a reason as to why the Confederates moved their capital so far north, other than, I'm just trying to think of it as perhaps, again, a, a way of demonstrating that Virginia is part of the Confederacy and perhaps, again, as a means of basically declaring to the north that the Confederacy is a fait accompli and uh, we will not sort of bow down under your threats of intimidation. How do you explain that? That's a really good question. Uh, I think what you answered is part of it. I've, I hypothesize that it's also to bring the capital closer to the, to sort of the center of the nervous system. I mean, Montgomery, Alabama is very out of the way in terms of where the key battles of the civil war are going to take place. It may have been to simply shorten the communication lines to South Carolina and also the Virginia front. I think it was mostly just an act of, um, I think it was mostly hubristic, to be honest, just because of the the, the concept of Virginia and its importance, as you mentioned. Uh, it really, uh, South Hall Freeman points out that uh, it really had no military purpose and was probably a bad idea. It actually dominated the way in which uh, Mr. Lee had to run his campaigns throughout the entire war and ultimately was probably a, a very bad idea. I mean, as we can see just in the map you have here, it's quite exposed to the unions uh, or the federals, as they're called mainly, uh, overwhelming naval superiority. Um, so yes, uh, Lee, Lee is called on by his home state of Virginia. He's after he retired from the, uh, federal armed forces, he said he'd never raise again his sword. His, he'd never raise his sword again, except in defense of his home state, his state. And then of course, his home state of Virginia then calls upon him to uh, be the commander, uh, at the rank of uh, brigadier general of the, of Virginia's armed forces. Uh, at this point, Virginia is not actually in the Confederacy, although obviously it's going to be working with the Confederacy as both are imminently to be invaded by the federal forces. So Lee finds himself in this sort of third army. Uh, he has a rank in Virginia's armed forces, not in the Confederacy. Uh, the Confederacy also, uh, a few weeks later, ends up offering him you know, their own... Uh, his own rank in that army, which he declines because he sides with Virginia. I, I think the interesting implication here is actually a, a lot of people say that this is because Lee didn't want to be demoted <laughs> because he. <laughs> yeah, I made... think that's not true. Yeah. Clearly, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it would it would have been a one level demotion. Uh, but he, the thing is, I mean, it's very clear that Lee was choosing Virginia, not the Confederacy. Virginia joins the Confederacy, but the, the, this first part of the war is very weird. Because Virginia has its own army at this point with Lee in command. And Lee's first command is basically figure out how Virginia is to be defended. And this is one of the great acts of his career is actually organizing the defense of Virginia from a mostly logistical perspective. Seeing that shoes, uh, weapons, ammunition, 
um, rail stock is used to bring all these things to where they need to be in order to defend the new capital and also the frontier to the extent that it can be defended. And of course, we have the situation where West Virginia is still in contention at this point uh, past the Shenandoah Valley there, as you can see on the map. Uh, there are also generals Floyd and Weiss who are more or less running their own own separate armed forces yes, in West that, Virginia. That, that's that's a very important point to mention. I believe both Floyd and Wise were former governors of Virginia. And this is something that Lee would have to come up two important points that Lee would have to well, actually three important points that Lee would have to come up with. One was the failure of establishing a unified command. Second was the issue of political nepotism within the higher ranks of the Virginia and later the Confederate Army. And third was Lee's diplomatic ability to have to deal with uh, jealousy and ambitions within the ranks of his own generals. It was something that he couldn't really understand. And often he wasn't strong enough in terms of being able to resist strong um, personalities as a result of this nepotistic system and often to his detriment. I mean, I believe his great strength in 1861, as you mentioned, was his ability to just, just think about it this way. They didn't have, the Southerners didn't have uniforms. They barely had weapons. They didn't have shoes. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't have shoes. They barely had any artillery. Um, they didn't even have constituted regiments. Um, they had officers because virtually all the mainline officers, except with the noteworthy exception of people like Winfield Scott, joined the cause of Virginia and by extension later the cause of the Confederacy. But that wasn't enough in order to be able to establish a army of home defense. So what is remarkable that given the very short window of time that Abraham Lincoln had given the Southern states to disband essentially and to come into reconciliation with the, with the North, uh, he had been able to organize an effective defense, even though most of the militiamen drawn up volunteers, again, uh, didn't have uniforms. There was very little cohesion. Within a month, he'd been able to establish the rudiments of what would later become the Army of North Virginia. He's not really in a position of military command up until this point. It's really his skills as a diplomat and his skills as a uh military commis com uh, com um, uh, commissariat and uh, logistics, which are coming to the aid to prevent the quick invasion of Virginia from all sides. But as you mentioned, Charlemagne, it wasn't enough. Uh, within West Virginia, there is their own separatist movement in Appalachia against the rest of Virginia, which the North exploit. And as you can see, uh, given the uh, Shenandoah Valley, it's actually very easy to invade West Virginia. So very quickly in 1861, West Virginia is occupied and later on West Virginia will secede from the state of Virginia and give the North you know, more senators and more votes in the House of Representatives. All of this is a disaster, but it's been saved by the fact that the state of Virginia has, despite its incredibly precarious political position, being able to amass some form of defense and is able, able even considering the political nature of the early Virginia army to achieve some victories. So, for example, um, Beauregard, uh, I believe, wins the first battle of Bull Run. And indeed, Lee, beyond his abilities as an administrator and beyond his relationship to Winfield Scott and his reputation established during the Mexican, um, the Mexican War, uh, he is not seen as the famous defender of the South during this time. He has been superseded by figures such as uh, A.S. Johnston, uh, Joseph Johnston, and of course, General Beauregard, who you've already brought up, um, Charlemagne. Um, indeed, he is derided when he is involved on a military campaign in the Valley for being overly cautious and ineffective. And he has given the moniker Granny Lee, which is completely remarkable when you consider his military career up until 1861 and even during 1861 until we get to the seven days campaign yes and of course th this nickname wasn't really duly earned it was given to him by the media uh, of course and you know really it has to do with lee not having adequate command over resources you know he was not uh, commander in chief or in any sense of the armed forces at this point you know he had his own separate command and he couldn't simply organize all of Virginia as he saw fit. He was dealing with other commanders like Johnston, 
there were Beauregard's needs um, south in the actual Confederacy proper. There was these generals and Wise and Floyd in, in West Virginia. And I think we can comment on at this point uh, possibly his biggest flaw, although it does have boons as a commander. Uh, was the fact that he always attempted to work within the shortcomings of his commanders rather than use his command authority to simply override them and, and compel them to, to follow out his orders exactly as he wanted. This, this really bites him later in the war, particularly in relation to Longstreet, but it happens with Wise and Floyd. Um, and partially, this is why West Virginia falls, because we can imagine alternative uh, histories wherein Lee forces these two uh, generals running their own forces uh, who are very uh, uh, ambitious and jealous of one another, forcing them to cooperate. He had the authority to do so, in fact, but Lee did not exercise his right of command uh, to the maximal extent. And this is perhaps one of his, his great weaknesses as a commander, um, although the strategy can have its... Uh, successes as well um so this is sort of what because he doesn't act as decisively as he could with the with the authority given to him this is why he earns that nickname uh granny lee should be pointed out as well that virginia is working with uh mostly older uh percussion muskets at this point um and or sorry flintlock not percussion um and you know, there aren't very many of them either. They have about 60,000 small arms available uh, for the entire armed forces. Uh, so the the forces that get organized to defend Virginia initially are really only a few thousand across uh, many front lines, uh, you know, east of Virginia, uh, in West Virginia, north on the border with Maryland uh, by the Potomac. Uh, so Lee, Lee doesn't really have... Lee's not in charge at this point of, of Virginia's military forces. He's only one cog in the machine. Um, another figure we could point to at this point is uh, General Johnston, mm -hmm. um, who's sort well, of... Well, he's got the largest um, corps, I think, of the Army of Virginia. He has some 30,000 men um, around this time, which is by far the largest contingent of, um, of military forces. And he plays a very important role in the peninsula campaign. You can almost say he is the anti Lee in terms of, yes, his, that's uh, what I was going to say <laughs> in terms of his much chided, uh, proclivity to, uh, retreat prematurely. Um, but the effect of the first battle of Bull Run, which again, wasn't Lee's victory. It was Beauregard's, uh, prevents the union from being able to simply invade Virginia directly, um, from the North. And instead it opts for a amphibious, uh, campaign, which you can see on the map on the right, uh, which is the peninsula campaign. The peninsula campaign is led by one, uh, George B. McClellan, who had fought alongside Lee in the Mexican War. McClellan's, interestingly enough, I actually had a far more negative view of McClellan until I did my research on Lee. And now I, I, I hope I have a far more nuanced perspective on him because- uh, I came to the same conclusion. <laughs> well, that's good. Um, because he was great at logistics. He was great at being able to assemble vast amounts of supplies and being able to deploy and maintain uh, discipline in an army and constantly receive reinforcements and buttress a seemingly unassailable position as a result of the Peninsula Campaign. The object of the Peninsula Campaign, again, this was early in the war when both sides believed there was going to be a quick victory. In fact, given the loss of West Virginia and the incursions into Tennessee, it looked as if the war could possibly be over by 1862 and that McClellan could lead the Peninsula Campaign to the capture of Richmond and given the fact that the South don't have a sufficient victory in order to instill morale in the ranks, it would have been enough to precipitate a negotiated peace. Um, McClellan's slow, methodical approach to Richmond, you can say, relies on the Union strengths, which is the massive, uh, the abundance of manpower vis-a-vis -vis the South. In terms of population, I mean, this is incredible. 23 million Americans in the Northern states, 9 million in the southern states, 3 million of whom are slaves. So in terms of available manpower, 
the South has roughly a quarter to a third of that of the North. And so McClellan, rather than rushing into a premature battle where all of those advantages will be lost, attempts to use the logistical advantages and the material advantages of the North to essentially bring around a victory by a siege of Richmond as per the Peninsula campaign. Um, and Johnston, of course, Joseph Johnston, uh, facilitates this when he retreats first and then launches a abortive attack at the Battle of Seven Pines and is wounded during that battle. And it's yes. very clear, yeah, and it's very clear that at this point it could be the end of the Confederacy after the Battle of Seven Pines and now the loss of leadership because the um the highest ranking field officer has been wounded in battle. And it's at this point that Lee assumes command and you can say Lee's ascent into uh, demigod status begins. Um, but before we get there, I, I would like to get your perspective on the military situation up to that point. Well, uh, as was Southall points out in the book, it was, it was said that the shot that uh, injured Johnson basically saved the Confederacy because now Lee assumes Johnson's command. And, and this is, really where uh, the general Lee emerges, because now he's in command of critical defenses of, of Virginia. And we get to the seven days, which is, in my opinion, the most important period of the entire war. He's up against McClellan, as uh, you said. McClellan is fairly derided in history, but I think, as Lee himself said it, out of the generals he faced, McClellan was the greatest. Uh, and I think if McClellan had maintained uh, his command, uh, the war might have ended much sooner uh, with a Union victory. Uh, so anyway, in regards to the specifics, I mean, one of the things Lee took from Napoleon in particular is to never find yourself in a siege, to always maneuver constantly. And Lee demonstrates his uh, mastery of maneuver warfare. Uh, I mean, effectively, the entire war for the Army of Northern Virginia is maneuver warfare, moving his, moving around his inferior forces uh, in particularly daring and risky maneuvers. Uh, to uh, outflank um, or even come up into the rear of the Union forces, which were superior in number and technology in every way possible. And this was really the only strategy that could have possibly uh, succeeded against the Union as well. Could, now, I, could I emphasize that? Sorry, I just need to point something yeah. out. Descent into demigod status. Again, I'm, I'm really sorry if I said that, but obviously that's a, a contradiction in terms, but thank you for pointing out. Um <laughs> As um, we've gone over with the Mexican War, and as we've gone over with Veracruz, and again, in contrast to Napoleon, Lee ought to have excelled when it came to strategic superiority in firepower and technology. What is remarkable about Lee when we get to this point, and something I couldn't really believe when reading about him, is in defiance of all of his experience, he is able to identify the only strategy in which the South can effectively win, which is an aggressive strategy of outflanking maneuver and being able to essentially nullify all the material and firepower advantages that the North has. You can say that given Lee's background, he should have been a Southern McClellan. But of course, he cannot adopt that position due to the inferiority of the South in terms of being able to win a war. I mean, it's not just a manpower disparity or a technological disparity, but it's also a industrial disparity. Apart from a few factories in Richmond, and you can say which is the wealthiest and most industrialized state in the South at this time, which is Georgia, um, the South does not have in any way the industrial capacity in order to fight a long-term war with the North. And Lee consistently understands this and argues this point. Um, in terms of him being given command, something that we've overlooked, I think, is Jefferson Davis had many weaknesses as a leader. Like one of the facts about Davis, which is rather frustrating is the fact that he would not defer his military authority despite not being a competent tactician despite what his background would leave you to believe with his right uh, davis davis war. uh went to west point with lee yes in one year beneath him i think or they might have been in the same class but it should be pointed out that davis does have military experience 
Yes, he, he does. And he was Secretary of War when Lee was at West Point, which is why this relationship was able to establish. But he wasn't the military mastermind in terms of being able to conduct this campaign. And neither was Lincoln, it should be pointed out. Yes. But Lincoln could have the luxury of not being a strategist, given the advantages he had. All he had to do was maintain the North's ability to continue fighting and keep winning the political battles and his extra constitutional powers and when necessary replace generals but even though Lincoln as I I think we both believe now shot himself in the foot when he removed McClellan shortly after the battle of um, Sharpsburg um, but regarding Davison Jefferson Davis his greatest asset in this term, in this in this context is his dependence on Lee I don't believe Davis could have foreseen a situation in which Lee could have emerged as the brilliant figure he did in June and July of 1862. But nevertheless, it is that personal relationship and that contact that Jefferson Davis has with Lee that is the reason as to why Lee was empowered at that point to take over after uh, Joseph Johnston. And he never loses that connection with Jefferson Davis, even though there are various attempts by the Confederate Congress to strip Jefferson Davis of his position, appoint a commanding general like that of the North, and even defer his position of commander in chief to a generalissimo like 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 Lee. He never does that, but nevertheless, Lee has his confidence throughout the entirety of the war. Yes, this is a serious problem for the South, is Lee actually does become commander in chief effectively of the South's entire military uh, very late in the war. Uh, Davis should have deferred as much authority as possible to him from the very beginning. Obviously, that's hard to, to, in retrospect, that's obvious. I think we can say in retrospect, if Lee had been given maximal authority, uh, he could have effectively organized the forces because he was the one general, it's clear, who really understood the strategy that the South needed in order to defeat the North. But he was constantly uh, asking... Uh, the president Davis uh, and the secretary of war for the needed to conduct his campaigns, but they would have had to been stripped from Beauregard who was, you know, justifiably also one of those forces for the defense of South Carolina. Uh, but Lee really understood where the Confederate resources needed to be deployed in order to win a victory for the South. Uh, now the point we're at now we see, I believe we see uh, Thomas Jackson or Stonewall Jackson on the map. Uh, just just before, because you bring up a lot of interesting points regarding Lee is interesting in the fact that as he is a Virginian, as his political soul is invested in Virginia, as his entire conception of fighting with the South is as part of the continued defense of Virginia versus the aggression of the North, Lee remains a commander of Virginia and really never becomes a commander of the Confederacy. And even towards the end of the war, he essentially rejects any possibility of him usurping the power of Davis and fundamentally altering the position or the justification, the casus belli of the South to maintain states' rights. And you can say the original spirit of the Constitution, that should be clear. But look at the precarious situation in the South. You have Mississippi, which was one point of attack, but whereby the North could, and indeed did, split the Confederacy in two. You have the border from Kentucky and Tennessee, and at this time it wasn't clear whether Kentucky was going to join the Confederacy or remain neutral. And then on top of that, you have the naval supremacy of the North, which means that, as we see with the Peninsula Campaign under McClellan, the and with various vulnerable positions such as Charleston and Savannah, the South could be invaded almost at will by incursions of essentially Northern Marines. Um, and this meant that the entire defense of the South extended, essentially the South was already overextended, in addition to having all of these industrial and manpower um, deficiencies when it comes to uh, creating any sort of parity with the North, which is frankly preposterous. Yes, and it should be pointed out, almost immediately the South, uh, or sorry, the, the federal forces sailed down the Mississippi and captured the port of New Orleans, effectively splitting the Confederacy in two, um, and also laid siege to Mobile Bay and, yes, threatened the entire East Coast. Uh, we should also you know, point out that for the duration of the entire war, you had, I think, 
four main armies. You had, uh, I believe it was Pemberton in command, uh, who ultimately uh, surrendered at Vicksburg. You had, I think, Bragg in Tennessee, which is an entirely separate theater from Virginia. You had Beauregard um, in the Carolinas, and then you had Lee in Virginia. So effectively, you have four completely independent commands, no unified command at the top. And this way, we you know we can think about Napoleon. Right? Napoleon had the advantage of being emperor. Uh, he was the warlord. Lee was not that. He commanded the Army of Northern Virginia, and above him there was a president of a republic, and he he did not occupy the same position someone like a Napoleon did. So though we might compare Napoleon to Lee in terms of their strategy and tactics, uh, they in no way occupied the same position. And in fact, you know, one thing uh, Napoleon had is is massive reserves of men and technology to call upon, whereas Lee only had a constantly diminishing uh, and weakening force uh, throughout the duration of the war. And Lee's only way to offset that was to demand more conscripts and to prevent the Confederates' uh, Congress from interfering in terms of placing political uh, appointees in positions of command. Um, all of these issues Lee had to consistently deal with. And indeed, even had those examples existed, Lee spiritually and politically his deferment was always to civilian command he did not believe in military political command and given his propensity towards diplomacy and deferment rather than control he never imposed his will on on davis either he would long have exasperated conferences with the confederate secretary of war and davis but he could never impose his will on them even by force of personality so let's uh, let's get to the seven days itself now. So you have this map up on the screen. Um, we see uh, Jackson on the map there, Stonewall Jackson. He has completed an excellent campaign in the Shenandoah Valley at this point. Uh, basically, uh, you know, winning first Manassas there uh, and producing a great victory for the South and sort of securing the Western flank of Virginia. Uh, and now he's under the command of Lee in the defense of, Vir of, of Virginia. And we see some of Lee's uh, main commanders on the map here. We have A.B. Hill, D.H. Hill, Longstreet, Jackson. Uh, do we have Anderson here? I don't believe so. So Lee's goal here, basically, McClellan is slowly advancing through very strong positions systematically towards Richmond. Uh, we could see he's only a few miles from Richmond. Lee's plan is to do a risky outflanking maneuver. And as um, Southall Freeman describes it, basically do a Kandy maneuver or, or Kanai, or whoever you say it, on uh, McClellan and surround them, uh, win a decisive victory, effectively capture the bulk of the Army of the Potomac at this point, and uh, bring an end to the war. And that's really the only hope the South has. Is, is Could I quickly decisive. summarize what Cannae means? <laughs> yeah, I so, guess that's a good yeah. idea. <laughs> uh, so at the Battle of Cannae, Hannibal had a army which essentially was half the size of the fully assembled might of the Roman Republic. He did have one advantage, though, which he pressed in the conflict, which was superior cavalry which meant that essentially he could prevent, he, he could outflank the forces of the Romans and he had superior intelligence. As the Romans advanced into the Carthaginian lines, the worst troops in the Carthaginian army were put up essentially as cannon fodder for the Romans, which allowed the Romans to think as they were plowing into the Carthaginian lines that they were in fact advancing when in fact they were being enveloped from both sides. So as the Romans were tiring, they were in fact now meeting the Carthaginian veterans and elites and the whole arc of the Carthaginian army had gone from a forward, essentially a forward bow, and had retracted into an arch, which meant with the dominance of cavalry, the Roman position was completely entrapped and it turned into a bloodbath for the Romans where out of an army of 80,000, virtually all of them were captured, wounded or killed. An envelopment strategy given the vulnerability of, the, of McClellan's position, which is dependent on uh, naval access for his position, I, forget the exact place but I'll, I'll see it on the map here uh, which is at Fort Monroe and uh, Williamsburg etc and access to the York River and the James River that is the, pro the, the aspect of development here is crucial and you mentioned earlier 
the idea that this is probably the most important campaign of the entire civil war. And I'm inclined to agree with you um, for several reasons. One is that this is one of the few times in which Lee actually has parity with McClellan in terms of numbers. McClellan has essentially fallen into the Cannae entrapment as a result, albeit inadvertently, as a result of the Battle of the Seven Pines and uh, Joseph Johnston's premature retreat, bringing the Union Army too close to Richmond. Given the status of the Union Army, its material advantages and the disorderly impression given by the Confederate armies and the quick change in command, there is nothing to suggest from McClellan's point of view that Lee could adopt such a highly aggressive improvised strategy, which is what he did. And very quickly in the campaign, which begins on the 25th of June with uh, Oak Grove and later Beaver Dam Creek, McClellan loses the initiative to Lee. He's been outgeneraled simply due to the audacity and the aggressiveness of Lee in this attempt to create an enveloping strategy and cut off the access of McClellan's army, the Army of Potomac, to be able to retreat back to Washington. Effectively, if this army had been captured or destroyed, it could have been used as a bargaining chip in terms of being able to force a peace on the North. And even if it hadn't led to peace, all of the equipment, the artillery, um, the rifles would have been enough to buttress the Army of North Virginia for months, if not years. However, you mention Stonewall Jackson's uh, brilliant campaign in the valley. He comes down and he essentially represents that major wing of the Confederate army, which is meant to envelop the positions of McClellan. And something bizarre here happens, which is the uh, Battle of Glendale, which is also known, I've read as the Battle of Fraser's Farm, in which Stonewall Jackson is given the chance essentially to attack the the federal army before it is able to assume a strong position and during the june during june the 30th he essentially loses all tactical ability and all desire to even fight i mean it's one of these legends in the civil war especially when you look at him at chancellorsville at the battle at the battle of, at the valley campaign and you look at his audacity you look at his aggressive strategy and how he is integral to lee's entire command structure in this entire scheme, the Battle of Fraser's Field looks like this great anomaly. And I think this is also foreshadows aspects of Pickett's charge and the fallibility of Lee when it comes to an aggressive strategy at Gettysburg, because this failure to, uh, to essentially encircle the army and follow up on the previous battles and the initiative that Lee has gained is followed up by the Battle of Malvern Hill, whereby Lee needlessly expends southern soldiers in a series of frontal assaults against McClellan's army. In my mind, the failure of Stonewall Jackson at Fraser's Field is enough to allow Lee to still gain a victory. He is out General McClellan. He's been able to force, in a very short amount of time, the Peninsula Campaign to retreat back to the coast. But this is something really key to understand in terms of the limitations of Lee's access to troops and the entire sort of pervading um, military strategy here. This is, to my mind, one of the few times that Lee ever had the opportunity to capture and defeat an army. In all of his other battles, he is only able to force an army into retreat. And that is because Lee does not have the power in terms of firepower or men to be able to pursue and destroy. Essentially, the Northern armies regroup and they're able to fight at a later date. Here is that one opportunity here it is lost. And as a result, McClellan is able to successfully withdraw and the Army of the Potomac is able to fight another day when it comes to the Maryland campaign. Do you think that's a fair assessment? Yes. Um, just want to add, I mean, I tend to avoid what ifs in terms of, you know, what, what, what was the one decision that could have won the war, lost the war? I think here, if Lee had been able to direct direct his forces in a matter which properly encircled and captured the bulk of them, uh, this is really the moment where the Confederacy could have won the Civil War because it's not guaranteed, but it would have permitted a much earlier invasion of the North. The Army of the Potomac would have been crippled. 
the South would have had far more of the much needed supplies. Uh, you know, there was great success in this battle. It was a clear and excellent victory, but the problem was the South could not follow up on it as was the case in every single battle. Cause basically every set piece battle Lee undertakes his army is in such a state where it really only has the capacity to win a battle and then there's no follow through. So no matter how many victories Lee can achieve in his campaign, it's never enough. You need that single decisive victory in order to win the war. And this is really the one point where it could have happened. And it doesn't happen here. Um, you know, many will blame probably rightly um, Stonewall for failing to complete his maneuver. That said, uh, for some reason, Lee did not see to it that adequate maps of the area were available. So there was some cases where uh, the commanders actually got lost uh, outflank, trying to outflank the uh, the federal forces. So we can't we can't bl uh, place the blame entirely on Jackson. That said, Jackson did ultimately fail to be in the position he needed to be in time in order to complete the encirclement, and. You know, I'm not saying Jackson lost the war, but the fail, the failure to encircle McClellan here, um, really damped dampened the South's uh, hopes of, of winning the war. And you know, the the problem is Lee attempted this very bold strategic uh, maneuver, but his army at this point really wasn't a professional army, right? The commanders were professionals in large part, but there were some political appointments as well. And they didn't have battlefield experience. The machinery of warfare on the scale wasn't greased yet, and he's got a large number of conscripts, just vol or really volunteers at this point, right? But they're not professional soldiers. So, attempting a maneuver of this complexity simply wasn't within the capabilities of his army at the time, and that's really the ultimate reason why it failed. No, I I completely agree with you. I think th the thing here is that Lee had an incredibly audacious strategy. And this is essentially a failure to be able to implement strategy on a tactical level due to all of the deficiencies that South had. But all, I, I won't say that Jackson's um, failure to act in this no. way helped. But nevertheless, what is remarkable here isn't that Lee was unable to achieve a cane, is that he almost achieved a cane despite this being really his only experience leading an army in his entire life. That really should yes. be illustrated here. Yeah, no, he does envelop uh, um, um, the Army of the Potomac, if not encircle it, captures totally necessary supplies. I mean, the amount of supply captured from the Federals uh, in this battle really go, really sustain the Confederacy for the next year of the war. Uh, and he, ultimately, he kicks McClellan off the peninsula. Uh, so this, this is a critical campaign, the most important one of the war. It doesn't but it's not decisive. That's the key. Uh, Lee wins a series of battles here and McClellan decides to retreat and this saves the Confederacy, uh, but it doesn't win the war. And that is the real tragedy of the seven days is that the opportunity to inflict that decisive blow um, never quite comes again. This was really the moment. And due to a number of factors, ultimately uh, conclude, uh, culminating in, in, the army simply not being prepared for maneuvers of this complexity. Um, it couldn't be done. Uh, so Lee's first campaign um, goes incredibly well, uh, but just sort of godlike, I guess we could say. I, I think and that's fair. I mean, it, it's it's brilliant. I mean, this, this campaign alone probably prolonged the defeat of the Confederacy by two years. Um, the war could have been over in 1863, 1862, depending on... I mean, even if Lee hadn't assumed command, I don't see the Confederacy having held out for longer. Um, there is a point which a lot of people draw on to criticize Lee, which is high casualties. Now, you need to understand, Lee's, as Charlemagne's pointed out, the South had deficiencies in firepower and they had deficiencies in training. The Army of Northern Virginia only really became a coherent unit after Fredericksburg and in order to fight the battle at Chancellorsville. As a result of that, Lee had to rely on infantry. And of course, if there's any aspect of an army which was to incur the greatest losses, Pickett's Charge you know, being the most obvious example, you're going to incur vast casual vast casualties when it comes to repeated infantry offensives. 
the deficiency of the Confederacy here is that Lee needed to expend um, those men and suffer those casualties in order to achieve a victory. However, every time he won, he was making the Confederacy weaker by comparison because the North could continually replace those losses and the South could not. The only advantage, therefore, that the South really gained other than defending um, Virginia and being able to forestall constant Union attack, with the exception of the overall strategic implications of the Seven Days, is that the Army of North Virginia was able to survive by scavenging. First of all, this came to scavenging of guns, artillery pieces. And as the situation with the Army of North Virginia became more desperate, this became scavenging for food. Uh, again, a, another point to mention is that it's not only deficiencies in uniforms, deficiencies in boots, deficiencies in gun, but deficiencies in being able to supply, supply and maintain and feed an army when the critical infrastructure in Virginia is not only sparse, but it's constantly under attack by cavalry raiding parties sent in from uh, Maryland. Yes, I mean, basically for the entire war, uh, the Confederates are surviving on scavenging and capturing supplies um, from defeated federal armies on their retreat. It's quite remarkable, really, how the Army of Northern Virginia manages to maintain its function all the way up until Appotomox uh, Courthouse uh, by just uh, basically looting the federal stores every time they win a battle and continuing their existence up until the next battle where they can loot more federal stores. <laughs> so, yes, now we get to Second Manassas. Um, well, you changed the slide, so go ahead. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's all we that's all we can really say on the on the seven days. I mean, we we, we both essentially come to the same conclusion. But moving on from the Seven Days campaign and getting to Second Bull Run, Second Manassas, this the effect of this battle is to confirm the Confederate position in Northern Virginia and mm -hmm. gives the impetus for the Confederacy to cross over into Maryland and begin the Maryland campaign. But in terms of Lee's overall sort of strategy, Lee now is constantly outnumbered. Almost in every one of his battles from here on out, he is outnumbered sometimes one, sometimes two to three, sometimes one to three, um, most consistently about two to one. In this battle, of course, he's outnumbered about 50,000 men in his army versus 77,000. But this is the first battle in which he is strategically in command, but he has deferred um, actual sort of tactical demand to generals such as Stonewall Jackson and General Longstreet, uh, who is going to use more and more over the course of the next year. And he is able to inflict a decisive victory over the Army of Virginia and the Army of Potomac under John Pope, and he's able to inflict twice as many casualties. So you can say other than the um, far more complicated nature and the lost opportunities of the Seven Days campaign, the battle of the second, the second battle of Bull Run is the first thing you can describe as a decisive, clean victory for the Confederacy. Well, it's a clean, it's a victory. I wouldn't say it's decisive. Um, none of the victories for Lee in his entire campaign are decisive, which is the problem of the entire war, but it is a victory. But by decisive, I think we're defining this as destroying or crippling the enemy army rather than forcing them to retreat. Is that fair? I don't even know if I would say that because often what happens is the federal forces overestimate uh, who crippled who. I mean, often the Confederates end up in the more vulnerable position, but due to uh, their general's mastery, the, the Federals simply don't realize how much of a material advantage they actually enjoy over the Confederates and end up retreating, beaten, but not crippled. They sort of view themselves as being crippled because they have the sense that they're up against a much stronger force than they actually are. So a lot of Lee's victories are attributable simply to the Federals overestimating his strength simply because of the aptitude by which he actually um, directs his forces. So I wouldn't even say that Lee really managed to cripple the Confederate, the, the Federals in any of these particular battles either. Oh, oh, no, I don't mean to imply that he did. I'm simply meaning to imply that that's how we would define decisive. 
Um, in each case here, he forces the army to retreat, yet yeah, the army so, is able to consolidate and fight again. So this one is under the command of John Pope as opposed to uh, McClellan. And yeah, the outcome of Manassas or Second Manassas is that, okay, Virginia, Richmond has been defended now from McClellan, but we still have Northern Virginia um, on the border of Maryland to worry about. Uh, you can see the Potomac here uh, in the map and, and of course, Washington, D.C. So what this battle effectively does is secure the territory of Virginia as it's constituted after West Virginia secedes from the state. Uh, so this is very important because now the Confederacy has, you know, demonstrated not that it can defend its capital, but also that it can secure its most critical borders uh, with the Union. Um, in terms of the battle itself, I don't think this is one of his greatest just in terms of exhibiting any particular tactical genius, but it's simply competently executed in order to inflict a defeat on the Federals such that they lose far more men, uh, both killed and casualties in the battle. In, in terms of, you, you mentioned obviously the strategic benefit of securing Northern Virginia, but also it informs Lee's overall strategy in that he believes the only way to effect a victory is to imperil the political situation in the North by maybe even coaxing the slave states in the North to come over to the Confederate side. And that would entail cutting Washington off and thereby perhaps precipitating negotiations of peace. Um, again, even though we have been at pains to illustrate that Lee deferred ultimately to civilian command, he had his own political objectives whenever he was fighting a campaign. So his goal was to bring peace negotiations up. He didn't believe peace would be definitive in either case. He simply believed that reaching negotiations would be a breakthrough. Then he would defer to the will of the politicians. But even if negotiations didn't go well, he believed that the South could take up arms again. But he believed just getting the North to the position of negotiation would politically weaken Abraham Lincoln sufficiently in order to perhaps gain uh, attainable goals for the South, even without the prospect of outright secession. However, this we need to illustrate here that even though that's Lee's position within his grand strategy, Jefferson Davis was determined to fight for the cause of secession. And he would apologize for the cause of secession afterwards, as opposed to Lee, who is fundamentally a unionist, but a Virginian first. For Lee, the effects of the Maryland campaign is very much political. When he marches into Maryland, he does not do so as, as an invader of the North. He does so in the guise of attempting to liberate Maryland. Um, not attain Maryland for the Confederacy, but his explicit remark regarding the Maryland campaign is to free Maryland from the encroachments of the federal government, obviously Washington, D.C., everything to the North is Maryland, and allow Maryland the option via popular sovereignty to attain independence, to join the Confederacy, or to remain part of the Union. So in this way, you can say that Lee has taken the ostensible reasons for Virginia's own independence, which was predicated on the idea of popular sovereignty. And he's trying to take that example and use it as a means of being able to force the Northern states to come over to the prospect of peace and put pressure on the federal government. However, this, as we see with the Gettysburg campaign, is, you, you can say in terms of its strategy, it's rather brilliant, but it's very, very poorly implemented. And another aspect to Lee, which I find rather quite frustrating, is the fact that he was not a lucky general. One of Napoleon's most famous comments is that one supreme art of generalship is the ability to master luck. In the case with Lee, having divided his army into five columns and marched into Maryland with the ability of trying to affect this political outcome, the battle plans are captured by McClellan. And I think this, this really should illustrate actually how McClellan was not a pushover and he was not a terrible general. He had the material advantages in which he believed that the fall of Richmond was assured because he could not have anticipated someone like Lee embarking on such an audacious strategy. But once McClellan has access to Lee's master plan for the invasion of Maryland and possibly advancing into Pennsylvania, McClellan seizes upon the opportunity and aggressively attacks Robert E. Lee. And when we come to the Battle of Sharpsburg, um, Antietam, what is remarkable here is that Lee survives at all. 
given the complete sort of tactical exposure that has been given by the plans of the Confederacy falling into the falling into uh, federal hands. So I'd like you to sort of expound perhaps a little bit more on that and uh, talk about the battle specifically. Uh, at Manassas? Uh, no, at Sharpsburg. Sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> you confused me there. Yeah, so Sharpsburg is important. Uh, this is sort of the... Yeah, there we go. This is It's called Antietam uh, in Yankee lingo, but, you know, Sharpsburg is one of his most, uh, you know, another one of his important battles. This is sort of the culmination of his invasion of Maryland in order to, uh, well, there are a number of things just to add on what you mentioned there. I mean, Lincoln tended to panic anytime something like this happened. So the sort of campaign that he's on right now at Sharpsburg uh, or in Maryland, rather, uh, what it does is it triggers Lincoln to pull back forces in order to defend Washington because he's afraid of the city being taken. And this really, this, this campaign, although it's an offensive, it's also a defensive because it helps protect the rest of Virginia where there aren't adequate forces to defend simply from Lincoln's paranoia. Okay, so Sharpsburg itself. Well, yes, just just to add on that point you brought up, his belief also in terms of strategy was that every time he invaded the North, the positions of the Union armies on the coast in the South and the ability of the Union to be able to attack places like the Mississippi and Tennessee, Lincoln would be forced to sacrifice Union troops and all other fronts to come to the defense of the capital. So Sharpsburg itself was a very difficult and grueling battle. Um, effectively, what you have here is a battlefield divided into three uh, different parts. Um, and Lee had to traverse uh, the different parts of the battlefield uh, constantly throughout the day uh, to organize the defense of Sharpsburg. And the Confederates uh, really came close to the breaking point um, at Sharpsburg. Um, and uh, if I recall correctly, uh, effectively, both sides expected the other to launch an offensive um, on the next day because uh, each was so completely bloodied, um, but nothing ended up happening and they retreated. Now, let's see if is it legible on the map here. Um, not quite, but you can kind of make out how the, the battlefield is sort of divided by the rich, the terrain. Um, which makes it difficult for uh, the flanks and the center to actually support each other. Sharpsburg, I believe, was actually the bloodiest day of the war, and it brought the Maryland campaign to a to a close. And you know, this is this is sort of the problem, right? Is is Lee manages to win a victory at Sharpsburg? I think after three days of fighting. Um, no, I think I'm mixing my battles here. Uh, so Lee wins a victory at Sharpsburg, but the problem is, is it brings the campaign in Maryland in an end to an end. And this sort of cuts short the idea that you're basically liberating Maryland from the dominion of the Federals. So Sharpsburg is sort of a great example where Lee wins a victory uh, by the skin of his teeth, but, but is unable to follow up on it, even though the, the Union army is uh, just about equally as bloodied. So... Uh, could I add to add to some of that? Um, yeah. what, what I find remarkable about Sharpsburg is that Lee has been completely undone by the failure of intelligence and his plans having fallen into the lap of McClellan. And McClellan. Oh acting... God! Yes, I forgot about that. Yes. So, <laughs> yes, uh, McClell McClellan's back in command here. This this is really well. If Providence is involved in the campaign, then here it is. I mean, effectively, Lee has come up with this strategy in order to soundly defeat uh, McClellan in Maryland. And he probably would have, except for the fact that one copy of the orders Lee dispatched uh, regarding another, you know, he was executing another sort of grand maneuver in order to outflank McClellan before his forces concentrated. One thing Lee wanted to avoid, uh, basically, was to not allow the Federals to concentrate their forces uh, before uh, the uh, and defeat them in detail, because again, he was always outnumbered. So some cigars were wrapped in one of the orders, and Union forces simply found the orders on cigar paper. 
uh, and McClellan had full knowledge of the exact plans of General Lee uh, down to every single detail. I mean, this was the order to his uh, generals, uh, Longstreet and Jackson, uh, for how uh, the following day's operations were to be carried out. And, and just so, on that note regarding McClellan, I mean, McClellan is criticized for being overly cautious, but it was actually, for his point of view, a huge gambit and a risk to be able to trust the entire strategy to what could have been a very contentious piece of military misinformation. Yeah, that's actually a good point. Um, having only read Robert E. Lee's biography, I don't know the exact... McClellan's side as to what the de how this decision ultimately came about, but that's actually a good point. Uh, unfortunately for Lee, it was the real orders, and it's honestly astonishing that despite McClellan knowing exactly how Lee planned to defeat him, Lee was still able to win a victory, if not the decisive one he was seeking um, at this battle. And th this was an incredibly intense battle to run, because like I said, the, the front was more or less divided into three separate battles because of the terrain, and Lee had to move between them constantly in order to direct basically three different battles at once. Um, which is a remarkable feat of generalship, actually. And he was, you know, and th the redeployments necessary in order to uh, maneuver forces from one flank to another were extremely difficult for that reason as well. But this was done handily. And uh, I can't remember uh, which general, it might have been Anderson he was waiting on, but basically the day more or less gets saved. AP Hill. AP Hill coming in from, yeah, I see on the map there. AP Hill comes in from the south with sort of uh, three or 5,000 fresh reinforcements, something along that number. And this sort of turns the tide on the, the southern flank, which was under immense pressure uh, from the Federals. Actually, on that flank in particular, um, I believe it was that flank. I know it was this battle, um, if I recall correctly, is where the, the Confederates were reduced to throwing rocks uh, at the Federals. Am I correct on that? Or is that or is that um, is that Chancellorsville? I believe it was actually Sharp Sharpsburg. Um, even if I'm not recalling that particular anecdote correctly, the the southern flank was in um, a very high risk situation. Uh, but the arrival of AP Hill, um, as his reinforcements were expected, finally reinforced the southern flank and basically saved the the line from collapse. The northern flank as well. Uh, was also uh, very early on in the battle at risk of collapsing. As you can see on the map there on the right, um, they were giving a lot of ground to the Federals. And this was a huge problem because, uh, you know, basically as soon as the, the battle started, the northern flank was, or sorry, the, Lee's left flank was already under immense pressure and starting to collapse. And once, you know, if the left flank had collapsed, it would have run into the center and routed his army. Um... So let's see. Anything else on Sharpsburg? Uh, I have quite a. I have. A, I have a few points. Um, someone in the chat is saying it was a Union victory. Well, let me contextualize this. It was a strategic Union victory, but it was a tactical Confederate victory. It was a strategic Union victory in the sense that McClellan was able to prevent the invasion of Maryland and force. Lee back on the defensive. However, despite Lee's plans having been exposed to McClellan, Lee was able to preserve the Army of North Virginia, which given the, the nature of the disparity between the numbers and the material and McClellan's advanced warning of his plans, the fact that Lee was able to adopt a defensive strategy, the fact that he was able to compensate for this tactically sort of disastrous situation or strategically disastrous situation and able to hold together this battle, this defensive battle. I mean, when you look at the Seven Days campaign, he is very much acting essentially as the um, the strategic author of that campaign, but he does not implement it. At the Second Battle of Manassas, he is doing the same thing. He, following with Winfield Scott, he assembles the troops at a certain position, and then his corps commanders, in this case Longstreet and Jackson, do the fighting for him. In this case, Lee is almost directly responsible for tactical operations within the battle over a diminished army of some 40,000 men who are engaged. He's able to prevent McClellan from destroying the uh, the core, the vanguard of the Army of North Virginia. And in many ways, I actually see parallels between this and Marengo. Lee is able to effectively permit the retreat 
of the Army of North Virginia and preserved the army in the process. But Marengo, as with Napoleon, which is only won by the intervention of Desai, here is won by the decisive intervention of A.P. Hill. And that may be a reason as to why he was later given a position of corps command at the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, but even though you can say the Union won in the sense that they were able to force the Maryland campaign to a premature end, the fact that Lee was dealt such a decisive disadvantage and he was able to hold the army together and allow it to fight another day at Fredericksburg is nothing short of a miracle. Yeah, and one of the things uh, Southall Freeman points out in this battle is is the reason the army was able to hold together is because at this point, the machinery of warfare is actually working. Um, Lee is able to direct each flank of the battle. The commanders on, of each uh, corps and the separate brigades are able to communicate with each other effectively so that their, their needs and situation at the present moment can be understood. Um, and their commanders, Jackson and Longstreet, are able to uh, disseminate their orders effectively along the entire front in order to hold things together. And, you know, we also shouldn't just discount the raw heroicism of uh, the, the Confederates themselves. The, the infantry men who held the lines because by all accounts they really should have broken run but the fact is uh the army of northern virginia had such high morale that it was able to hold together despite everything being to their disadvantage yes i think i think lee brings a strategic brilliance to buttress what is essentially southern valor in this case and I, again it's the reliance on the infantry and the fact that man to man it appears that the southern infantry are better than the union infantry despite the disadvantages yeah far better and it well, the, the morale of the Army of Northern Virginia is some of the highest I've ever seen in, in any army throughout history, and it, it really shows itself here. Um, so, yes, like we said, um, at the end of this battle, uh, both armies are completely battered, expecting the other to attack, um, but neither does. Um, you know, this is once again a situation, I, I think, if the Federals really realized how battered and out of ammunition the uh, Confederates were, they McClellan actually would have attacked. But of course, being the ever so cautious commander he is, um, declines to do so. And after that, he's relieved of command. And ultimately, Lee thinks that uh, Lincoln has done him a favor because his appraisal of McClellan at Sharpsburg is that he's actually maturing into a competent commander. He's beginning to slowly uh, eliminate some of, some of his deficiencies. Instead, the command is then of the reinvigorated and reinforced Army of the Potomac is given to one Burnside, who goes on and invades Virginia again in uh, Spotsylvania County at the Battle of Fredericksburg. And I have actually very little to say on this because I attribute Lee's victory here due to the incompetence of the Union and the valor and the discipline and the creation of a effective army of North Virginia, which is the legacy of those previous campaigns and battles that we've illustrated. Lee is now in a position as also per his scavenging campaign that the army of North Virginia is an incredibly effective and formidable military unit. Burnside uses his vast advantage in manpower at the Battle of Fredericksburg, it's 80,000 versus around 120,000. And he launches a series of doomed assaults in order to dislodge the Confederate position. And it turns out to be a complete disaster for the Army of the Potomac. And as usual, it basically confirms uh, Virginia's defense on the side of the Confederacy. Do you think that's a fair assessment? Yeah, I mean, there's a little more we can say on Fredericksburg. I mean, Fredericksburg in the winter of uh, 1862 is really where the strains of the Confederacy's position start to show themselves. Uh, the winter is very harsh. You know, they went into Maryland uh, in large part simply to forage for supplies, you know, food for the horses, uh, primarily to be, to be honest, is, is their, their situation in terms of keeping their cavalry running was pretty desperate. And the, you know, the South uh, simply could not feed its army and its cavalry at this point. Um, and that was one of the main reasons to go into the North, because the, the fields of uh, Virginia and other parts of the South were simply being stripped bare at this point. Now they're back in the South. Um, this is where Lee actually directs uh, um, the defense of a city in 
sort of siege circumstances to some extent, which is interesting. This is um, different from the other battles he's participated in at this point, where he's actually occupying a city and the heights uh, on its flank, uh, Mary's Heights, I believe they're called. Um, you know, here he shows his skill um, in engineering, directing the construction of uh, field fortifications. Uh, I guess to contextualize the battle, basically Fredericksburg is on a river. The Union forces are on the opposite side of the river. Uh, they have to create pontoon bridges across the river in order to attack. Uh, the situation, uh, you know, the, the, there's a couple situations to this battle where incorrect orders are given and the heights were actually abandoned uh, and then had to be retaken. And as you said, I think in large part, the Confederate success of this battle is simply due to the skill of their soldiers and the incompetence of the Union forces. And there's there's one more factor in the favor of the Confederacy, which is actually shown on the map on the right. Again, Lee's philosophy that the commanding general is responsible for bringing all the necessary forces to the field of battle, and Jackson and Longstreet are able to appear at Fredericksburg in order to defend it, combined with that of the uh, incompetence of Burnside. Yes. So, um, yeah, in terms of the battle itself, I mean, uh, Fredericksburg basically remains under siege for the duration of the winter, um, after which, um, you know, Lee evacuates the city. Uh, in terms of the battle itself, the, the Union could have followed up uh, on the battle and defeated the Confederates. And they more or less simply chose not to. I mean, I guess one of the most interesting attacks is their attack on Mary's Heights itself in the initial phases of the battle, um, which was simply disastrous. I mean, the Federals literally attacked at the most obviously well-defended point on the Confederate line uh, for basically inexplicable reasons and had to advance, uh, I think, several hundred yards across the opposite bank of the river under a you know, withering artillery fire, uh, sort of just wasting their forces. So that... Uh, the way Burnside commanded his forces just didn't really make any sense in this battle. Um, but yeah, other than that, I don't really think there's anything particularly remarkable to comment on here in terms of, uh, you know, Lee's performance. I think that the most interesting part of the battle itself is simply that the strain you see on the Confederate forces in terms of actually maintaining their ammunition, um, their cavalry and their troops with adequate food and, shoes i mean at this point the army has marched so much that their shoes are wearing out and you see uh you know I, I think at one point a truce is declared uh so that both sides can go uh to, to the battlefield in front of mary's heights and recover the corpses uh i believe there's a anecdote here where you know a confederate soldier takes the shoes from uh some um federal dead and he's criticized by the uh federals because you're not supposed to you know loot the battlefield uh during a truce for you know recovering the dead and wounded uh but he does it anyway because the confederates are literally running out of shoes so of course the, but the union doesn't have this problem at all um the union is is you know fully stocked and the confederates are, are really on the knife's edge at this point and i think it's it's hard to imagine you know we'll get to gettysburg soon enough but it's difficult to imagine from Fredericksburg onward what um, the Confederates could have possibly done to actually win the war at this point. I mean, even in Maryland, let's say um, Sharpsburg didn't happen and Lee was able to decisively defeat uh, McClellan. Um, I'm not even sure if, if the damage at that point to the Army of the Potomac would have been enough to actually conclude the war because we have to remind ourselves that we have uh, the Confederate forces in Tennessee at this point, um, uh, the Confederate forces down the, or sorry, the federal forces down the Mississippi river sieging Vicksburg, uh, you know, things are not going well for the Confederacy at all. Well, I mean, Lee's assessment here is essentially a political calculation. It's how much can command of the, the military situation and the political situation does Lincoln have how long are the Northerners, the Yankees, going to go along with this position of just felling tens and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of men to keep the Union together? And if it's a cause even worth justifying, especially as this is pre-emancipation proclamation, other than the defense of the Union, there isn't a 
core conception essentially of what the federals are fighting and as you say lincoln is known to be panicky and his conception is essentially that you know if washington is imperiled then it could seriously weaken his political position and i think that's all robert e lee has in terms of the ability to undermine the north's ability or sort of desire to fight as opposed to actually win in a campaign of total war which the north is ultimately waging against the south um, so yeah, I, I think the next battle is. Well, yes. Sanford's before battle. before I before I get to that, I just have a very short excerpt from Freeman regarding the effect of the campaigns in 1862, which I'll get to before Chancellorsville. Sure. The year 1862 had indeed been one of victory in Virginia, at least during the seven months Lee had commanded the army. Port Republic, Cross Keys, uh, Mechanicsville, Gaines Mill, Savage Station, Fraser's Farm, Malvern Hill. Cedar Mountain, Second Manassas, Boonsboro, Harpers Ferry, Sharpsburg, and Fredericksburg. Thirteen battles, great and small, had been fought during that time, and the Confederates had remained masters of the field in every instance except at Bonsboro and at Sharpsburg. Leaving out the accounts of the actions at Cross Keys, Port Republic, and Cedar Mountain, which were tactically Stonewall Jackson's, though Lee had a part in the general strategy, the troop under, troops under Lee's command had on account of gains and losses, they had sustained 48,000 casualties and had inflicted 70,000. They had taken from the enemy approximately 75,000 small arms and had yielded scarcely more than 6,000. With the loss of eight cannon, they had secured 155 cannon. The infantry practically had been rearmed re with improved captured rifles, and half the batteries boasted superior ordnance that had belonged to the Army of the Potomac. The morale of the Army of Northern Virginia was vastly higher than it had been when Lee took command. Yet there were there was a consciousness in the ranks, though not in Richmond or in the Richmond executive offices, of the persistent, determined spirit of an enemy who would replace every fallen soldier, make every every captured arm and supply every necessity of the Army of the Potomac from ample manufactories and open ports. Richmond was fearful of military defeat, but refused to admit the inevitable consequences of economic attrition. The Army of Northern Virginia was confident of victory in the field, but fearful of economic disaster behind the lines. Before the winter was to end, the danger of starvation and of immobility resulting from the collapse of transportation was to be plain to every private in the ranks. I think that just confirms more of what we, we have both been saying. Um, so yes, on to Chancellorsville, what uh, Freeman referred to as the perfect victory of Lee, but also the case in which he lost Stonewall Jackson. So I'll defer to you here. Yes. Yeah, so Chancellorsville, we have a lot to say on this one. Um, you know, this is one of Lee's greatest victories, but also one of the greatest defeats of the Confederacy uh, due to the loss of Stonewall Jackson um, in pretty ignominious circumstances. I mean, it's once again, I suppose here you see the hand of Providence at work. Um so Chancellorsville, Lee is up against Hooker here. Um, they, the Federal Army, has uh, crossed the river uh, in front of Fredericksburg. Uh, it's not. Do you remember the name of the river? It doesn't matter. Um, the Federal Army is is across the river and approaching the the town of Chancellorsville, which I think is not really a town. It's like a few buildings. Lee, once again, is incredibly outnumbered here. Um, Stonewall Jackson um, determines that he should undertake one of the most bold maneuvers of the entire war. Um, and Yes, just for perspective, Lee has 60,000 and the Union has 130,000, if not more, 140,000. So yeah, absolutely now, outnumbered. There's also a very large front here, so we can see the disposition of the forces in question. Um, the Federals have Sedgwick over on their left, on Lee's right. Uh, Lee has Early over on the right, defending Fredericksburg. Uh, what ends up happening is Lee actually bluffs the Federals by leaving basically a token force defending Fredericksburg, so that Longstreet can concentrate his core on the uh, Confederate uh, center um, where General Lee will remain while Jackson undergoes this uh, very long march through the woods. So think about the Chancellorsville area, as you can kind of see on the map with the green dots, as it's uh, more forested. Um, so there's a lot of cover through which the um, Confederate forces can make this long march through. Now, 
while they're uh, conferring at Lee's headquarters, uh, Jackson proposes to uh, go around here, um, and he you know draws the line you see on the map. And uh, Lee asks, "What do you propose to make this movement with?" And Jackson answers, "My whole core." Um, so J- Jackson is literally taking half of the Confederate army, uh, marching it through this grand maneuver to come up uh, on the uh, right flank of the Federals and roll up the entire army basically in the surprise attack. Um, This is incredibly risky. It should be pointed out that this maneuver is not suggested because of the bravado of General Jackson uh, per se, but simply because of the absolute desperation of the situation. Uh, You know, the situation is more or less hopeless. There's no way that uh, Lee can actually outmatch his opponent here other than with some high risk maneuver like this. And fortunately Lee is intelligent enough to realize that in situations as in Chancellorsville, these high risk maneuvers simply have to be undertaken. Um, The hooker general hooker, unfortunately uh, receives for his side receives word uh, of the Confederate March. Uh, Some of the uh, union pickets actually spot some Confederate movements um, happening but it's either uh, not believed or the actual scale of the maneuver is not realized and it's simply ignored um so with his token to force token force left in his right flank uh, general early holding off sedgwick and um jackson's maneuver successful in the evening uh when jackson actually arrives around i believe 5 30 close to sundown um he achieves complete surprise on the Federals and attacks uh, the right flank with his entire corps. Um, the, the Federals are actually sitting down to make dinner at that moment, so they're completely unprepared for uh, Confederate forces to appear, much less uh, attack their entire flank. Uh, during this maneuvering, of course, during the day, Lee is sort of making a pretense of having more forces available than he actually does uh, under Longstreet, um, who are attacking the, the the federal center and attempting to buy time for Jackson to complete this maneuver. And, uh, you know, the maneuver succeeds completely admirably and entirely repositions the uh, federal army uh, by nightfall into a much worse position where they have a uh, more exposed salient. And uh, unfortunately... Uh, that night, Jackson is sort of uh, scouting, actually, after driving the uh, federal line uh, in a route uh, to reorganize uh, in this sort of cluster with the, with the center. Uh, Jackson is, is actually scouting himself into the woods, possibly to undertake uh, a night attack. Uh, on the way back, he's actually fired upon by his own troops, who thinks they're uh, federals, and he doesn't die there. He dies, I believe, actually. A few, two weeks or something like that later, but he's taken out of commission and ultimately dies. Um, and Lee loses his right hand, uh, so to speak. Um, well, there's actually this... quite a there's actually quite a tragic quote about that because Jack Jackson loses his left arm; it's amputated before he dies. And um, Lee is essentially desperate to hold on to him. He's constantly sending letters saying, "You know, I can't lose you." You know. You may have you may have lost your left hand, but if I lose you, I have lost my right. Um, so Lee was aware of how much he was indebted to Jackson for this victory, because during the as you mentioned the woodland attack, there were virtually no communications between both sides of the army. Lee had no idea whether the attack was successful until after it had happened, and he had by that time only heard reports of Jackson's you know, injury as as a result of friendly fire. Um, this whole maneuver could have been an utter disaster. It was precipitated, as you say, because of desperation. And Lee wasn't going to be as audacious as Jackson, but Jackson had sold him on this incredibly risky plan to divide the army into two corps and for Jackson to commit his strategy to attack the Union right, which was incredibly successful, as you've outlined. But this was essentially Lee deferring his command to his most able lieutenant. And as we see with Gettysburg, 
what Lee himself will say is that the loss of Jackson was critical to the failure of that campaign. We'll go more into that. Um, but you can say Chancellorsville is in many sense one of his greatest victories, especially when one puts it in terms of the numbers which were arrayed against the Confederate position, uh, but also the beginning of the end. I should also uh, just point out for anyone interested in the, the details of these maneuvers, um, one of the better sort of history battle mapping channels out there, uh, History March, actually put out a video, a uh, half hour video on Chancellorsville uh, just six days ago. So definitely worth watching. And, you know, we, we can't really understate that this is one of the great military maneuvers of all time. Uh, Lee is fighting... Um, hopeless battle in the center, simply on the hope that Jackson's march is able to uh, complete for the flanking attack in the evening. The Federals could simply overrun him at any point. Uh, Sedgwick on the Federal left is underutilized and uh, isn't maneuvered back to the center to support and doesn't attack early. So there's sort of an intel there's serious intelligence failures on the Federal side and a sort of failure on General Hooker's part to utilize his forces effectively against the extremely vulnerable um confederate army um you know the the two the two factors of this battle are the holding action in the center um which can only really uh which only really works because of the cover provided by the terrain here sort of obscuring the actual you know disposition of the confederate forces the it's it's simply difficult to see in many parts of this battle, which is what enabled this enables this maneuver to happen and enable to lead a sort of uh, um, uh, make it appear like he has a much stronger line than he actually does. But effectively, Longstreet's entire core um, that's actually available is, is the entire thing is attacking, and Lee basically has has no reserves available whatsoever. Uh, so yeah, Stonewall Jackson is lost here. If there was any hope for the Confederacy at this point, it's pretty much lost with Jackson because this is, I guess, where we can bring into some of Lee's deficiency as a commander in and also Longstreet's. Uh, I, I think we, we, I think how I'm going to structure this stream because I'm conscious about time here. Uh, we'll get into Gettysburg. I have okay. a, re I have a review of 1864 and 1865, but I, I don't want to really get into too much detail other than to emphasize grant and his strategy more broadly um but i really want to get into that regarding gettysburg um what i want to say is more again ap appealing to lee's political strategy when it comes to gettysburg chancellorsville prevents again a another forestalls another invasion of virginia an attack on richmond and it motivates lee to reorganize the army into three corps he promotes A.P. Hill, who was responsible in many ways for the victory at Sharpsburg. He also promotes in the stead of Stonewall Jackson, a general called Ewell, who is not on familiar terms with Lee, but who has essentially been given a impeccable um, uh, letters of recommendation to suggest that position of corps commander to replace Stonewall Jackson. And then you have other generals who are have up until this point been absolutely essential uh, to Lee, which are Jeb Stuart, the commander of cavalry, who is also uh, dependable in terms of uh, military reconnaissance and intelligence. And then, of course, we have General Longstreet. The invasion into Pennsylvania is, again, following in the same sort of strategy as that of the Maryland campaign. Lee wants to cut Washington off either by winning one great victory against the Union in the North and then attacking either Baltimore in Maryland or Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. However, again, this is a public relations campaign as well. And this is why I think Lee's reputation is so, it inspires so much sort of um, feelings of admiration and wonder in comparison to someone like Sherman. And I think taking Sherman's march to the sea and comparing it with Lee here is really quite, really quite um, incredible because Lee was conscious of the fact that he was ostensibly creating an army of conscience, despite the accusations that the Southern army was simply there for the maintenance of slavery. Lee believed that the army of Northern Virginia had essentially assumed that of a Christian mission. The only thing I can really compare this to 
I mean, obviously Cromwell would refer to this in terms of the Christian mission of the new model army. But this has many allusions to me to Charles the Twelfth, the King of Sweden, who fought the protracted Great Northern War um, against the forces of Poland, Denmark, and of Russia. In the case of Charles the Twelfth, he was constantly fighting against superior Russian numbers until he was finally defeated at Poltava. However, in the case of Charles the Twelfth, he had one fundamental asset which Lee does not have. He had the advantages of weapons, artillery, and training, which none of these aspects Lee had. So, if anything, Lee's achievement here is even greater than that of um, Charles the Twelfth. But as with Charles the Twelfth and and Cromwell, the emphasis here was on creating an army of conscience, an army which had some sort of religious instilled fervor, and the idea that the the army was essentially an extension of the Confederate fetishization of the preservation of states' rights, and in particular that of property rights. So when the Confederate army moves into North Virginia, this is after the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation has actually had the opposite effect on Southern morale. It has emboldened the Southern army to believe that the North is, again, conspiring against the property right of the South by attempting to impose the abolition of slavery on the South by military fiat. In contrast to this, in the invasion of Pennsylvania, Lee is insistent that despite the, you have to imagine the desperation of the army of North Virginia to acquire forage, and Lee had to rely on forage in terms of being able to distance himself from Harper's Ferry and being able to sever essentially his supply lines in order to continue his campaign in the North. He insisted that for every military requisition, they be paid essentially back in kind the Confederates would have to pay for all of the resources extracted and foraged here. When court martials are taken into account, there were no instances of rape recorded by the Southern army as they moved into the North, and only a few instances of looting and pillaging, which were, which were punished quite severely. However, all of these sort of arguments really come to naught when one comes when one comes to the implications of military power politics. Sherman, by contrast, when he invaded, um, I believe it was uh, Georgia towards Savannah in late 1864, conducted scorched earth tactics. Again, you can see in the case of Lee, Lee was very much appealing as some sort of defender of the old constitution, what I refer to as antique America. And Sherman was embodying the tactics of scorched earth and total war, which are representative of how you would deal with a criminal insurgency or a rebellion in terms of contrasting those two political molds of generalship together. However, the invasion of the North had many strategic defects, which I believe are attributed to Lee directly. He had to rely more on Longstreet, more so than at any other time, because Longstreet was now his most reliable commander, given the fact that A.P. Hill and Ewell were now recently promoted in the three-core structure of the Confederate army. As a result of this, um, he should have confided and made Longstreet understand his strategy, which was to go north and fight an aggressive campaign, winning one decisive victory that would open the way to Philadelphia or Baltimore. Longstreet, however, believed that Lee was attempting to have a more successful iteration of Sharpsburg, that is a offensive defensive strategy, marching into the north and then luring a Union army into a trap whereby Lee would be on the defensive and be able to gain that necessary advantage that would be accrued from defending a fortified position. Longstreet was never convinced of that plan of an offensive strategy, even on the third day of Gettysburg when he launches Pickett's Charge. When you look at, again, I'm very much sort of painting broad strokes here, but when you look at Gettysburg, it is very clear that Lee had not given his three corps commanders an adequate sort of explanation of what he was attempting to achieve. At first, he was attempting to direct Longstreet to attack the Union right flank at Gettysburg, and Longstreet had no intention of carrying out these orders to the extent that this is really rather incredible. Lee was surveying the battle on his famous horse Traveller, and he actually had to ride alongside Longstreet during the early stages of the battle in order to ensure his orders were being properly, um, properly carried out. This again speaks to the limitations of Lee as a commander. He was a diplomat. He negotiated his positions with his generals. He did not impose 
a coherent strategy upon which his generals would execute those orders. In the same way, General Ewell was shown as completely pusillanimous during this campaign and had no effective initiative. So Longstreet was effectively countermanding Lee's orders and Ewell showed no private um, personal initiative. As a result of this, um, Lee's personal strategy of assembling his forces at the site of battle and then deferring command upon his able subordinates really suffers here from the lack of Stonewall Jackson. What he needed was a general who could effectively execute a aggressive strategy, as we saw with Chancellorsville. But at Gettysburg, I would say none of his core commanders had faith in Lee's strategy to such an extent that he had a coherent strategy at all at Gettysburg. And when we get to the instance of Gettysburg and the third day and Pickett's charge, what is remarkable about Pickett's charge is that Longstreet conducts that campaign almost as an admission of defeat. The original intention of attacking the Union army on the right is instead compromise for an attack on the well-fortified garrison position in the center where artillery fire would be directed at the Confederate advance. What is, if you look at Pickett's charge, the defect, the casualties are horrific. Of 12,000 men, virtually 10,000 men are killed. And yet Southern, the Southern discipline and formation is able to survive throughout that constant bombardment and the severe loss of life to the point that all of those troops are fu fundamentally sort of gunned down, which is really rather incredible to consider. But with all that taken into account, I almost believe that the Gettysburg campaign, regardless of the intentions behind Lee and whether his strategy of cutting Washington off by going to Baltimore or Philadelphia would have been a success, I don't see as tactically and strategically envisaged by Lee, how this could have been a success. But I'm painting this very broad stroke, so very much like to get your opinion on this. Yes, well, here we open up the door to a lot of speculation. Everyone knows the name Gettysburg, um, really because it's the first real defeat uh, that Lee suffers in the field, although both sides inflict tremendous casualties uh, to one another. You know, the the campaign ends in failure similar to how the the maryland campaign ended although in maryland you know lee ostensibly had a sort of victory at sharpsburg but gettysburg is much more equivocal it's not decisive for the federals but this was more or less the last hope for the army of northern virginia again i think i've said that multiple times but the problem is uh he this campaign needed to be conducted in some sense simply to forage in the north uh, where there was actual food available and there simply wasn't any left in Virginia. Lee at this point, I think more, I, I think part of what's motivating him is he simply wants to avoid a siege of Richmond because he knows, he knows once Richmond uh, is under siege, it's simply a ticking clock at this point. So whether or not success in Pennsylvania um, could have won the war for the Confederacy um, in a way, it is perhaps the only maneuver really left to the Army of Nor Northern Virginia, despite the high risk that could have resulted in any fruits at all, because uh, it, one cannot possibly imagine how a siege of Virginia, uh, of Richmond, could have been won. Um, th there's really no way to countenance that. I mean, alternatively, you could imagine sort of abandoning Virginia and destroying Sherman's army, which, which was envisioned um, at some point. But I think in, in principle... The Pennsylvania offensive was sound. The problem is Lee loses uh, Stonewall Jackson. Now, so Lee was forced to reorganize his army in a sense because one of his two corps commanders are gone. And there's really no one who can replace Jackson. Now, his particular decisions are definitely questionable because Lee has two corps under Jackson and Longstreet. For some reason he decides to split the army into three corps, cannibalizing some of Longstreet's half of the army, um, who now, and Longstreet only now commands a third of the army, and creates two due corps for Ewell and A.P. Hill, who simply don't have the um, capacity to command corps, uh, especially Ewell, um, who, who doesn't display the necessary initiative. So for some reason, Lee has put two-thirds of his army under... Uh, the the two lesser commanders uh, for this extremely bold offensive. Why he chose to do that, I couldn't possibly say. I mean, in retrospect, the the clearer um, 
the 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 choice that seems more sensible would have been to simply create a second core, uh, but only you know at a third of the size and enlarge Longstreet's core, and and then perhaps once that commander gained experience, uh, you know, um, re enlarge his side uh, as, as new conscripts come in or, or or whatever. So why why he chose to divide the army to three cores and place the bulk of it under uh, commanders um, who didn't have the capacity or experience obviously um to command their cores that kind of remains a mystery to me i don't know if you would have come in there before i continue well i mean with ap hill i can understand it because he had an impeccable military record he'd been there at sharpsburg and he had a ongoing relationship with lee yes ap hill is a logical choice i you will should have simply been left out ap hill given um a, a minor core in comparison to Longstreet's, and then enlarged once he gained experience. And Longstreet should have been perfectly sort of on board and privy to Lee's overall strategy because Longstreet himself did not believe in the Gettysburg campaign. But there's another angle to it, which is that Jeb Stuart, the cavalry commander, reconnaissance was again a crucial element to Lee's ability to be able to fight. And throughout the early elements of the Gettysburg campaign, they weren't in communication. I believe Jeb Stewart only came in, I, I think it was on the first or the second day of Gettysburg. So in addition to all of these problems with the strategic conception, the delegation of forces to untested commanders, uh, Lee himself wasn't being properly appraised the battle to the point, again, I find this completely remarkable in terms of the context of modern battles, where Lee had to charge his horse all across the battlefield to see what was going on and to direct his commanders personally due to the lack of intelligence. Yes, um, with Stonewall's death, uh, the machinery of the army simply fell apart. And, you know, with Longstreet being outright insubordinate um, and Ewell really showing no necessary initiative and Stuart not there uh, for the first day of the battle, uh, Lee had just nothing working for him. It's it's kind of mysterious why he didn't anticipate this, but nevertheless, uh, Gettysburg. The the you know the main reason it failed is because, well, for one, Gettysburg wasn't really supposed to happen. Um, Lee was planning on a much as you can see on the map, they didn't get very far into Pennsylvania. I mean, the the goal of the the campaign that wasn't to fight at Gettysburg he Lee was planning on foraging much longer and deeper into Pennsylvania um, before the battle at Gettysburg actually took place um, but unfortunately um, you know the, the the battle ended up taking place simply because of the disposition of the forces but even that being said uh, the Confederates had the opportunity to occupy high ground like Cemetery Hill the Cemetery Ridge and potentially take a little round top and big round top uh, after, you know, a day or two of battle. But instead of doing that due to the lack of comprehension of the plan, the lack of initiative of the commanders, the lack of Lee um, having intelligence as to what was happening on the battle in the battlefield, uh, these positions just were not occupied and they were left to the Confederates. I mean, sorry, the Federals uh, for some reason. So, uh, you know, basically, the the Confederates could have won at Gettysburg pretty handily, even with their handicaps, um, due to the inexperience of the new commanders, particularly Ewell and the insubordination of Longstreet. Uh, but they simply failed to occupy the obvious. I mean, once again, given Lee's experience, why he didn't see to it expressly that these positions were occupied is sort of beyond my comprehension, because. I guess this is one of his deficiencies as a commander. Is he just sort of assumed that um, his uh, underlings would would uh, use their discretion appropriately to achieve his aim? In this case, this is one of the cases where, due to what had happened with the reorganization of the army, um, he should have had a more heavy hand um, in dictating exactly which forces were to appear at which points in the battle at very specific times and allow minimal discretion in order to see that the overall strategy was carried out. You know, he simply did not um, ensure that his forces were organized in a way that would actually see his vision out. And yes, you're, you're, you're right too. He didn't really adequately communicate his attentions either. I think personally, I think the, the biggest failing of the, 
of Gettysburg can be attributed to simply Longstreet's insubordination. I mean, part of that is Lee's fault for allowing that to happen. But the problem with Longstreet for this entire campaign, and it really exhibits itself here um, in conjunction with his melancholy, is that Longstreet clearly viewed himself as Lee's equal, um, believed he could, and successfully did, because Lee allowed it, argue Lee into different positions. And it's clear that he did not really view himself as being Lee's subordinate exactly. Um, and this is really what lost the battle of Gettysburg. Um, if you want to, if you really want to put your finger on the biggest thing, I would place it on Longstreet's insubordination rather than say Ewell's inexperience. Well, all these factors contribute to the disaster. And I think it's fair to say that Gettysburg is Lee's only sort of unforced defeat. Um, all the others you can sort of understand in terms of disparities between manpower and, you know, an impossible position to, uh, to defend. But I think Gettysburg can fairly be said to be his only decisive defeat and his only unforced error in the grander scheme. Obviously, there were smaller errors, but nothing on the scale, especially that of picket charge and all the tragedies that led to that for the southern side. Um, and yes, I think it's interesting to consider that had the campaign been more focused on foraging and gone further north, it would have also served Lee's broader aims of being able to bring more over to the Peace Party. Um, again, you have to remember the Democrat Party in the north was still an effective political sort of um, outfit, even though the South had uh, opted for secession. The Democrats were still opposed, by and large, to what would later become the 14th Amendment. The Emancipation Proclamation was highly contentious. Um, you can say almost the Emancipation Proclamation and Gettysburg could have been a double-edged sword for Lincoln. It could have perturbed the more sort of moderate Republicans and the Democrats away from Lincoln, and it could have emboldened the South. Um, however, uh, this was a vindication of the Emancipation Proclamation. And with the Gettysburg Address, the conflict is recontextualized as that of the defending of the founding principles of liberty. And in that sense, all of Lee's attempts to give the South a moral victory, a propaganda victory, and a strategic military victory are all undone by Gettysburg and the ramifications of Gettysburg, after which the campaign becomes really increasingly desperate, which is why I don't really want to linger too much on various points. However, I will uh, simply emphasize that what, what I believe sort of distinguishes Lee from Burnside or Hooker or even McKellen to some degree, albeit I think McKellen is clearly the most and obviously Meade was the general who fought against Lee at Gettysburg. Um, Ulysses S. Grant was prepared to take higher losses of the Union Army in order not to retreat. And I think that sort of that sort of blindsided Lee to a degree because Lee had been so accustomed to a typical format of events in which the unions the Union Army attacked both the South and the North in accrued massive casualties, the North would retreat and reassemble, allowing for the South to focus on the defense of Richmond. And it's not simply a matter of Gettysburg having been the sole strategy of uh, Lee either. It was probably the sole strategy for winning the war, but Lee had been seeing also to the defense of Richmond for years up until this point, which allows P Petersburg and by extension Richmond to withstand a uh, prolonged siege that we see at the end of 1864. But I think Grant has a determination, and as with Lincoln, you can say, a willingness to endure vast amount of casualties and accept, you can say, Lee's overall strategic brilliance, but ultimately to deny him that one advantage, which was to allow Lee to have that ability to maneuver, to forage, to regroup, even though in a war of attrition, both economic attrition, naval attrition, and attrition of manpower, Lee was always becoming weaker as the Union Army was getting stronger. I mean, Lincoln was talking about assuming hundreds and 700,000 men at one point in terms of the Union Army, creating, by the end of 1845, 
in terms of manpower dedicated against Virginia and the Eastern Seaboard, we are seeing a disparity of somewhat 300,000 Union troops or federal troops versus 60,000 Confederates. They're outnumbered five to one, and that situation will only become more extreme as we arrive at the situation towards the Appomattox. But that's not to say that as a result of Gettysburg, um, Lee had simply given up. Rather, we see a an aspect of, again, that continued organizational and tactical brilliance, which ensures that the North Virginia Army, the Army of North Virginia, is able to survive over the ensuing essentially two years after Gettysburg, nearly two years. And I'm just going to read this excerpt regarding that battle from, um, from Freeman, and then I'm going to... Um, ask for your views on this, um, Charlemagne. But again, if you want to sort of um, interrupt me when I'm reading this, um, please do so as well. From the Confederate point of view, the whole of the Battle of the Wilderness, and this is the campaign, um, the first campaign led by Lee, sorry, Grant, uh, presented a succession of dangers and difficulties. If they were met by Lee in such a manner as to leave no just ground for criticism, except for his failure to fortify or to withdraw for the line of Heff and Wilcox on the night of the 5th, then the result manifestly is to a credit to Lee's generalship, but that is not all. When an army that is numerically to its enemy as 6 to 10 is able to inflict losses that are numerically to its enemy um, in the ratio of 14 to 7, then the question is raised as to the skill with which the larger army is handled especially in this case if most of the fighting occurs outside field fortifications. It is beyond the function of a biographer of Lee to criticize the skill of his opponents, but in reaching a fair appraisal of Lee's place as a soldier, the shortcomings of his adversaries must sometimes be taken into account. How was it that Grant exposed his right as he did on the 6th of May, with so large an army at his disposal? Why did he not more adequately cover his left flank, south of the plank road? One of the three conclusions seems inevitable. General Grant was less skillful in this battle, and these were referring to the various campaigns, obviously, of 1864, was less skillful than his previous achievements. And again, this is his campaign in, in Mississippi and the, um, the Central American campaigns would have led one to expect. Or he was carelessly contemptuous of Lee, or else he relied on the great superiority in numbers the neglect of the finer qualities of leadership. The transfer of the First Corps from the wilderness to the Battle of Spotsylvania on the night of May 7th to 8th to anticipate Grant's move to that point has always been grant, regarded as one of Lee's most brilliant achievements. In piecing information together and in deciding that Grant was making for Spotsylvania, Lee did more than he had done on a dozen occasions. The act was as spectacular because the results were. A close study of his logistics on May the 8th will show them to have been flawless. The student of war who is interested in the economy of force can hardly find a better example of exercise than go to Spotsylvania and try to locate in the face of an imaginary enemy a stronger line except for the mole shoe, the lead that, the mole shoe that Lee draw. Thrown on defensive with a smaller force, Lee sought to protect his men and to increase the effectiveness of their fire by giving them the full benefit of temporary earthworks, which had been done at Fredericksburg after the battle in 1862, and on the left in the initial stages of Chancellorsville campaign, in the forest along Mine Run, and in the wilderness, was done more elaborately across the fields and through the woods around Spotsylvania. At Spotsylvania, as in the wilderness, Lee was materially helped by the methods of his and the methods his antagonist applied. Grant did not hold literally to his boast, I never manoeuvre. He did manoeuvre, but he did not manoeuvre well. The chief criticism that must be made of the federal operations at Spotsylvania, however, is the manner in which Grant on the May on May 12 continued to hurl troops into the bloody angle until the capture position was so crowded with men that they got in each other's way. So I'm just going to, uh, that's all I'm going to read for now in terms of this gets up to the Battle of Cold Harbor, and this goes on to the Siege of Petersburg. Again, Cold Harbor is considered one of um, Lee's major strategic faults. Um, but this is simply to emphasize again that there are aspects of Lee's brilliance still in the face of Grant and 
given the overwhelming odds now arrayed and the hopeless possibility of a victory in 1864. But that's not to say that the Army of North Virginia simply gave up. There were still elements of tactical brilliance that are manifested here. Um, but really, I, I find it sort of futile to talk too much about this because we still have so much to talk about. Um, and really, I mean, this campaign is less interesting in the context of the strategic opportunities afforded by the Seven Days, by Sharpsburg or by Gettysburg. Definitely. Uh, Lee's goal in this campaign is simply to delay the siege of Richmond as long as possible. And if, you know, Providence permit, actually achieve a decisive victory over Grant's army and, you know, somehow throw a Hail Mary and, and still win the war. Um, all extremely unlikely. It's difficult to really see any possibility for that at this point in the war. I mean, in terms of Grant's generalship here, uh, I can't really say he it's exemplary. I mean, Grant basically just has such incredible superiority over the Southern forces at this point that, you know, he, I guess he realizes that he can simply hammer and march forward and, and engage in no complexities or retreats, um, you know, make of that what you will. More or less, he simply bludgeons his way through the, you know, mostly defeated South at this point, because, you know, the, the army of Northern Virginia only degrades as the war goes on and Grant's army is only getting stronger and stronger. Um, so at the very least, he understands what needs to be done. You know, previous commanders, uh, Burnside, Hooker, Pope, McClellan, you know, possibly would have all retreated after um, any defeat or serious engagement. But Grant will not do that. Um, he, he it should be said, too, that at this point, um, Sherman is also, you know, uh, I think taken Atlanta and possibly completed his march to the sea um when this campaign completed yes I mean, that was the, that... the confederacy has been split in three at this point mississippi has split texas from the rest of the confederacy uh with the fall of atlanta and marching through georgia uh sherman has split off the carolinas and virginia from florida and alabama so um it really is a completely desperate situation for the Confederacy. And the way that the Confederacy gets around this, um, Lee, of course, is concerned with desertion. He's concerned with lack of raw recruits. He attempts to ameliorate the situation uh, with more conscripts, albeit that's impossible. The army now is attempting desperately to find any supplies of food, which is now the paramount concern of being able to hold the Army of North Virginia together. And again, it's almost a testament to the logistical situation of the Army of North Virginia that they're able to hold discipline together for so long, considering the army is meat rations have essentially been cut. And the army in 1865 is on the verge of starvation. In terms of trying to provide some sort of out beyond more conscription, the army resorts to uh, hiring blacks in increasing numbers to perform non-military duties, essentially serving in mess halls, et cetera, and involving labor. Um, however, at, towards the end of the campaign, there is also the question of um, establishing black regiments in the army as well. And Lee reluctantly accepts this as a strategic necessity in order to prolong the war. Essentially, his mantra is, well, Jefferson Davis is determined to fight this until the end. And any sort of prospect of peace on the terms of the South is gone, even though Vice President Stevens is negotiating covertly with um, Abraham Lincoln as of early 1865. So all of this situation would indicate again that the Confederacy's goal is doomed, but nevertheless, Lee persists in his defense and he does it to the best of his ability. The only other question is whether Lee could have ostensibly been able to take power from Davis. And I think the assumption is that he could have and be made a military dictator. But again, in terms of advocating that Lee was always consistent to a very rigid set of principles, he had never suspended the idea of deferment to the authority of Virginia and by extension, the authority of the Confederacy, which was the government above, above that of the Virginia and the idea of military rule superseding that of civilian rule. And so the idea of Lee actually taking control of the overall war effort and superseding Davis as um, supreme commander of the armed forces of the Confederacy would have been anathema to Lee. So it was simply a matter of now of holding the army of North Virginia together and allowing enough men to survive until the Confederacy ultimately collapsed, which Lee was certain this would have been the case even before Gettysburg, effectively. 
Yes, I mean, Lee always deferred to the constituted authority, authority and the, the reason this um, campaign was conducted was because he was ordered to do so. So he was going to carry out the defense of uh, Virginia and the orders of the president to the best of his ability um, to the very end. Um, you know, Lee should certainly have been given um, supreme command of the Confederate military much earlier the, than it actually happened. Whether or not that would have made any difference, you know, it probably would not have at this point. But uh, this this plagued the Confederacy during the entire war, that there was simply no unified military command, and it remained um, under the president um, in a very direct manner. Uh, you know, the, the president um, in modern times doesn't conduct campaigns, right? I don't know. We can imagine World War II, right? The command of multiple countries is organized under uh, General Eisenhower. Uh, Robert E. Lee, if not the entire Confederacy, should have at least had Beauregard and probably Bragg under his command as well. Um, but, you know, whether or not Lee, Lee in his capacity at the head of the Army of Northern Virginia, <laughs> you could argue that, you know, he didn't have the bandwidth for, for that. But, I guess the, the point is the lack of a unified command of the Confederacy um, definitely led to its collapse. And in terms of this campaign, um, Lee distinguished himself certainly in a way by, as you read there, anticipating Grant's movements and maneuvering. I mean, once again, Lee's entire war was a campaign of maneuver, and he distinguished himself in his maneuvers here in order to to delay a siege of Richmond for as long as he possibly could um, very admirably. And it, it should be pointed out just the, 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 the absolute state of his forces at this point. I mean, um, he barely had cavalry at this point. Um, the, the horses simply could not be fed. Um, their artillery pieces um, were, were down uh, the, the, you know, many soldiers didn't have shoes at this point for the amount of marching they had done. Uh, ammunition was always running low. Uh, reinforcements. Beauregard was also competing with him for reinforcements, understandably, because he was now defending, you know, Savannah and Charleston from Sherman. So, um, yeah, I mean, do you want to go into anything more specific in, in Grant's campaign? No, I, I think that there is an aspect of inevitability, and Lee was perspicacious and gifted enough to understand this well before the politicians in Richmond um, understood this. Um, but th there is just one point. I, I was curious about the European perspective on the tactical operations of Lee. Uh, his main detractor was the Count of Paris, who was the Orleanist contender in the uh, the, the sort of dynastic uh, merry-go-round that was France during the 19th century. Uh, he wrote a, a book which was commonly considered to be um, critical of Lee's uh, military record. But I was conscious of, again, of looking at um, Clausewitz and German history of uh, movement warfare to see what the impression of the Prussians was. And one Prussian military attaché was um, one Eustace Scheibert. And the Prussians adored Lee. And I think it's blatantly obvious, given the fact that he was so committed to the process of movement warfare. It was the only option available to him. And despite his background in artillery, engineering, and topography, he was able to excel in the only viable sort of strategic option that was afforded him. And that seemed to have a significant impression upon Prussian European um, military opinion, which given the fact, I mean, I, I I don't think it's too significant, but nevertheless, it's interesting to consider, given the fact that after Gettysburg, you have the uh, Schleswig-Holstein War, then the 1866 war against Austria, and then the 1870-1870 war against France, that these effects are contemporaneous, and the Prussians are observing Lee's actions very closely here and taking note. But there is one important point to mention regarding 1865, as we see with Vice President Stevens and Lincoln. The same is the, the same predicament faces the actual army. The army needs to be supplied. The army needs to be fed. The horses are dying. Um, the situation is no longer a matter of fighting to defend the Confederacy. The matter is now that of survival for the troops and of receiving good conditions of surrender. And this is very interesting because something I've always wondered before really giving this topic a great deal of thought was the prospect of guerrilla warfare. And I'm just going to read um, this rather sort of famous exchange between Lee and uh, one General Alexander. 
General Alexander proposed as an alternative to surrender that the men take to the woods with their arms under orders to report to governors of their respective states. Lee saw much danger in this proposal to become guerrillas. General, he reasoned, you and I as Christian men have no right to consider only how this would affect us. We must consider its effect on the country as a whole. Already it is demoralized by the four years of war. If I took your advice, the men would be without rations and under no control of officers. They would be compelled to rob and steal in order to live. They would become mere bands of marauders and the enemy's cavalry would pursue them and overrun many sections they may never have occasion to visit. We would bring on a state of affairs it would take the country years to recover from. And as for myself, you young fellows might go to the bushwhacking, but the only dignified course for me would be to go to General Grant and surrender myself and take the consequences of my acts. So this is to say that, yes, Lee had probably prolonged the war, but he felt compelled by his particular sense of duty to prolong the war in terms of Virginia's defence. Now that victory for the Union was certain, and it now became a matter of unconditional surrender to the forces of Ulysses S. Grant, he was focused more on the afterwar situation and that of reconciliation and that of rebuilding the South after this devastating conflict, which would result in the loss of some 250,000 Southern soldiers, essentially the cream of that generation. So here, Lee is again remaining consistent to his values, which have been established very early in his life. He views the army as representing a constitutionally um, accredited, or what, what the word constituted authority, constitutionally <laughs> constituted authority, but you know what I mean. And now it is going to be disassembled and led to surrender that the only duty and obligation of him as a commander is to accept the fate look out for the interests of his men and look towards the future in terms of post-war reconstruction. And that really makes sense in terms of understanding Lee's Maryland campaign and looking at Lee's emphasis on the idea of the South as an army of conscience and his defense of property in the Pennsylvania campaign. All of this would be antithetical to the cause of a guerrilla campaign. And indeed, it also betrays the fact that Lee was not a a die-hard Southern separatist in any sense. He was willing to concede the victory of the Union if it meant that the process towards the reconstruction of Virginia could continue unabated. Yes, and since we've gotten to the surrender, um, you know, in terms of how it actually happened, Lee was marching, as we see here, from Petersburg to Lynchburg. Um, and, you know, he delayed in order to feed his men, which was necessary um around um appomattox and grant's forces uh simply completely surrounded lee i think he had like twenty thousand men or something left with him at that point out of the original uh sixty thousand uh, when the campaign had started and uh you know he realized there was simply no way out um and he wasn't going to attempt to bludgeon his, bludgeon his way out and basically get all his men killed or captured so you know realizing it was over he um extremely reluctantly and with a heavy heart, uh, you know, surrendered to Grant directly. And he was very careful in his negotiations by a uh, letter under flag of truce with Grant's officers. He didn't actually meet Grant, um, I believe, until the courthouse. I think he only met with underlings up until that point, which sort more or less disturbed him because Grant had, Grant had sent a message that, um, you know, surrender on these terms, um, you know, the, the, the terms, I should have the letter in front of me, but the terms were, were acceptable to Lee, but he was not ready to surrender. And then the next day he realized they were surrounded and he really hoped to get the same terms that Grant had offered, um, which I think was a uh, parole of the officers. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the release of the men basically. And well, those other smaller considerations like, um, Again, because the farming nature of the Southern Army, most of the horses that were part of the cavalry yes, were actually the, owned yes. by the soldiers. So he was concerned about getting those horses to be, you know, reused as um, which, farming stock. Which Grant didn't agree to explicitly, but Grant agreed. Grant said he would tell his men that the enlisted personnel. Um, you know, basically don't confiscate their horses. That wasn't in the official terms of surrender, um, but Grant more or less acceded to that. I mean, Grant, uh, on his part, um, 
behaved as as honorably as could be expected and you know treated his defeated foe um with um you know all of the rights and obligations that he ought to have and you know thankfully lee he didn't have to surrender um in uh ignoble conditions it was a noble defeat and you know his men for his men wanted him not to surrender you know the mm. the, the, the procession following the surrender um is you know absolutely heartbreaking in terms of the amount of uh tear shed by lee and all of his men and the adulations that you know he and traveler uh received after the army was uh surrendered basically um you know they still wanted to fight they the the absolute dedication you know we've talked some about desertions and things like that but in general um the army of northern virginia was absolutely dedicated to uh robert e lee and believed completely in his abilities to win them battles and never for a moment lost faith in him as a commander nor the will to fight even in the most trying conditions possible and that's that's really why the army was able to last for so long i mean definitely the the army of northern virginia was certainly the 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 best army um on you know this side of the atlantic uh for the duration of the war there was, there was no army on either side in the other theater that could really compare to it um, in terms of its morale, its, its ability to fight, its veterancy, um, the skill of its commanders. Um, it really is one of the most spectacular armies ever assembled in large part due to its commander, but also just the, the stock of the men um, actually in the army proper. And, and thank you for that. And of course, to, to contextualize the um, surrender at Appomattox, he was surrounded and he was outnumbered about six to one so the fact that his troops believed that there could be some way of saving face and uh, attaining victory really is incredible in terms of the mythos that Lee had established among his own men. That and the fact that the army hadn't simply collapsed due to the food situation and resulted to looting and uh, mutiny is, again, something which is really rather incredible and I think could be directly attributed to Lee. I just have a couple more segments to read before I want to get on to Lee after the war and Lee and the Lost Cause, which is something we can't avoid talking about. This segment um, involves the effect after Appomattox and him returning to Richmond post-siege. The streets through which General Lee rode in Manchester cut off his view of Richmond until he was close to the River James. Then he could see how deep and hideous were the scars on that city. Both bridges were gone. A line of federal pontoons afforded the only crossing. Nearly the whole waterfront had been consumed by fire that had followed the evacuation. Arsenals, factories, flouring mills, tobacco warehouses, stores, dwellings, all were destroyed. On his left, Belle Isle prison camp lay deserted. Beyond it, the Tredegar ironworks was intact, but east of it were blackened walls, sentinels over the once busy plants that had supplied him with shells and with small arms. Thence eastwards for nearly a mile, fire had levelled the city. Scarcely a wall stood shoulder high in the whole area, for safety had required the wrecking of those, the flames and the fall of floors had left standing. The street that had shown the proudest bustle in the days of the Confederacy now were mere tracks amid debris. Above them was the capital that Jefferson had designed, the capital in which Hudson's statue of Washington stood, the capital where Lee himself had received command of the Virginia troops, the capital where Jackson's body had lain in state, the capital through whose corridors had run the defiant voices of the Confederate Congress, swearing that the new nation should never know subjugation. And now over its roof, in the easy pride of assured possession, the Union flag was flying. Against the grey sky of the dark April afternoon, above the waste and wretchedness of that city, that colourful flag must have seemed to dominate Richmond as a symbol of conquest. And this is a short paragraph assessment of Lee and his overall summary of command. In three, yeah, sorry, do you want to comment oh, on, on that segment? Just uh, to add in as well, um, in terms of lee's command and the disposition disposition of the men i mean we didn't touch on but many occasions throughout the campaign he you know as we said he'd be riding around on his horse directing actions and anytime he came upon 
men in action who were demoralized. As soon as they realized who he was, their disposition would have immediately changed. And he could, you know, literally command them to march into hell if he wanted to. Um, that's the extent to which that's that's the effect he had on his troops. Um, and it's because um, you know, he earned it basically through his um his unparalleled skill and command. Um th these men were absolutely willing to do anything he ordered. And moreover, he had a personal effect on them such that as they laid sight on him and received orders from him directly on the field of battle, no matter how demoralized they were, um, you know, they would they would instantly, you know, turn around. You know, it's almost like you see in these, uh, you know, war game rules books where, you know, some officer will have some special ability to instantly restore morale. I mean, General Lee had that um in real life uh, as a man. It's it's quite remarkable. In three fast-moving months, he mobilized Virginia. Finding the Federals when he took command of the Army of Northern Virginia almost under the shadow of Richmond's steeples, he saved the capital from almost certain capture and the Confederate cause from probable collapse. He repulsed four major offensives against Richmond, and by the invasion of Pennsylvania, he delayed the fifth for ten months. Ere the Federals were back on the Richmond line, Lee had fought ten major battles. Six of these he'd indisputably won. At Fraser's farm, he had gained the field, but had not enveloped the enemy as he had planned. Success had not been his at Malvern Hill and at Sharpsburg, but only at Gettysburg had he met with definite defeat. During the 24 months when he had been free to employ open manoeuvre, he had sustained approximately 103,000 casualties and had inflicted 145,000. Chained at length to the Richmond defences, he had saved the capital from capture for 10 months. All this he had done in the face of repeated defeats for the southern troops in nearly every other part of the Confederacy. These difficulties of the South would have been even worse had the Army of North Virginia occupied so much of the thought and arm strength for the North. Lee is to be judged, in fact, not merely by what he accomplished with his own troops, by what he prevented in the hosts of the Union from doing sooner elsewhere. So with that, I think that's a, a very effective summary of his overall impression on battle something which is more interesting given what is going on today and what has really been intensifying since three years ago, 2020, since the mostly peaceful protests, quote unquote, is the effect on Lee in the immediate sort of circumstances regarding the post-war period and indeed after his death. In 1863, he had come down with a serious illness that would ultimately transpire, I believe, to be pericarditis, and he would die relatively shortly after the war in 1870. Nevertheless, there were many important events during the last five years of his life, uh, not just for Lee, but also for the cause of the Southern states in general. So obviously, the Confederacy surrenders. Uh, Abraham Lincoln um, is able to uh, begin the passage through of the 14th Amendment and ultimately the 15th Amendment will be pushed through over the next few years as well. As a consequence of this, the South is in an incredibly precarious position. During the first couple of years, Lee was actually, um, almost. it almost seemed as if Lee was going to make some sort of political comeback. There was even the prospect that Lee could have become governor of Virginia in 1867. After the war, he accepted a rather humble post, which was that of um, president of Washington College in Lexington. And this was seen as very consistent with essentially the mantra he had adopted, which was that of post-war reconciliation and that of allowing the Confederate veterans to return to their states and invest in the future of that state. And as we see with his career at West Point, in the case of Washington College, he was simply trying to emphasize that on educating the next generation. And that is indeed where Lee currently lies in the university chapel, or rather the Lee Chapel, where his body's interned. Uh, during this time, however, there were the obvious questions regarding the legality of his actions, the implications of his treason, was he to be treated as a rebel, and what were the effects going to be on Virginia as a result of um, 
the overall implications of the campaign. There's something else we haven't really mentioned, is that the huge personal toll that Lee suffered during the Civil War. During that time, Lee lost his daughter. Uh, he lost his daughter-in-law. Um, he had obviously lost many of his best generals. He had been personally affected by the loss of his men. And again, if we're looking to his emphasis on education and his experience in West Point and even the court marshals, I think it's fair to say that Lee had a far more direct personal investment in his troops than any sort of military bureaucrat or any sort of um, uh, megalomaniac would come to believe. In fact, what is also remarkable about Gettysburg in particular is that he would always take personal responsibility as the overseeing commanding officer, as the general, he would take personal responsibility for the defeats. He took personal responsibility for Gettysburg, even though he would later say that it was because he had lost Stonewall Jackson in the same way that he took personal responsibility for the surrender at Appomattox. And he believed that he was in part responsible for the reintegration of Virginia back into the Union. Now the cause of the Confederacy had been laid to rest. Jefferson Davis, by contrast, had been um, incarcerated in Fort Monroe until he was released and put on trial for treason. And it was only a blanket interception by President Johnson. Lincoln had been assassinated in 1865 at the beginning of his second term and was replaced by Andrew Johnson, who was a Democrat and uh, focused on the policies of reconciliation as opposed to radical reconstruction. And up until 1867, it appeared that Virginia could be reconstituted along with the other southern states under relatively amicable circumstances until we have uh, Thaddeus Stevens and the supermajority overturning the veto of Andrew Johnson and implementing radical reconstruction, which recontextualized the history of the South from 1867 until 1877 into that of direct military occupation. And as a consequence of this, the conditions, say, for example, of the reconstitution of Virginia were done on the basis of the disenfranchising of Confederate officers, insurrectionists and rebels, and of the enfranchisement of recently saved black slaves. So in terms of, I, I find this fascinating in terms of looking at the example of um, Dred Scott v. Sanford and seeing in 10 years how, as a consequence of radical reconstruction, the entire political structure and social structure of the South have been completely overturned. Lee was still trying to contextualize this within his defense of um, President Johnson. And um, Jefferson was still arguing for the cause of the Confederacy and Southern separatism. And so despite their amicability during this time, the legacy essentially of the Confederacy, Davis was trying to defend. Whereas as you mentioned earlier, Charlemagne, uh, Lee seldom ever talked about the war. Uh, which is rather remarkable given the fact that you would rest your entire sort of career essentially based on the examination of your victories and you can say your desire to retain some aspect of immortality as many other generals have but anyway i've sp spoken for far too long yes i find uh the roughly five years of uh mr lee's life following the war perhaps the most critical and interesting of his entire life really all eyes were on him in terms of the disposition of um, the the people of the South and the fact that he took a uh, fairly lowly position as a uh, superintendent of a pretty much wrecked university after the war demonstrated, uh, you know, a, a humility to all of the soldiers of the South that, um, you know, they, they should, um, you know, lay down their arms and there's no shame in, in returning to a, a humble civilian life. Uh, so all of his actions were, very much directed at ensuring the the peace and the restoration of the union. Um, you know, this is the the principles he'd lived by for the last few years of his life. It's interesting when you look at the broad picture of the war. I mean, if you want to sort of um, try and um, determine the the hand of providence that works, I mean, the way it looks to me is that uh, the South was given a um, a general who would be able to uh, ensure that the cost of the war was as high as possible on both the North and the South, and that the war went on for as long as it possibly could have. And interestingly, President Johnson, as you said, Andrew Johnson, 
uh, Lincoln's former vice president was very amicable to the South, but the legislative branch was uh, uh, seeking a more vengeful, um, you know, outcome to the war. And, and to, to the North's eternal shame, um, perhaps in contrast to the South's hubris in seceding in the first place, uh, they instituted the harsh reconstruction terms uh, upon the South, which, you know, you, we can say, uh, as I just mentioned, you know, the South paid dearly for um, its hubris in seceding uh, the North as well in, in blood for, you know, waging war. Uh, and then ultimately for their unjust peace, um, you know, the, the, the entire the, the entire country, the Unionist constituted is paying the price uh, to this day for the reconstruction imposed on the South. So it's really interesting to, to look at the entire conflict in that holistic lens. I mean, obviously, you know, these sort of contrast, uh, you know, these sort of outlooks are only really going to be understood by by people who, uh, you know, view things historically. And, you know, particularly I'm invoking a Christian view here, which, you know, obviously you understand as well. So so the, the entire thing is interesting from that perspective. But, you know, post-war, getting back onto the direct narrative, I mean, yes, Lee, Lee actually uh, succeeded admirably at restoring Washington University uh, to a highly successful school, um, taking it out of total ruin. And, you know, he, he, toward the later years of the war of 64, 65, he started to experience, you know, problems with his uh, heart, basically. And this is what ended his life rather prematurely in his mid sixties. Um, you look at a picture of him before the war, 1861, um, you see the younger, handsome man, you know, he's middle-aged in 1861, and he decides to grow a sort of the, the beard as soon as the war starts. And in 1865, we see here, he looks like an old man. So he's gone from middle age to old age, um, you know, just in the span of a few years uh, after the, the, toll, the toll the war took on him. You know, he traveled throughout the South, not on some sort of grand tour, but just on, you know, he suddenly had his estate to worry about again. The family had not done well in the war, you know, due to the confiscation. Yes, that, that, that's, an, that's an important point to consider. I mean, Again, we're talking about Lee's sense of duty versus the personal cost. We talked about originally how his focus was on Virginia. Well, in terms of the history of Virginia, in terms of the death toll, we also have to consider the dismemberment of the state of Virginia into West Virginia and the rest of Virginia. But there is also the consideration that Arlington and Alexandria were the first places to be occupied by the Union in the context of Virginia. So he lost his home almost instant, almost instantly. And by act of Congress soon after, the property of rebels was taxed, which effectively meant a form of confiscation. And as a result of that, the legality of the ownership of the Arlington House of the Custis property has been an issue plaguing that plaguing that area for the last sort of 150 years but to say the least he had to he was in a very financially precarious situation and you can almost say taking the modest position of the presidency of Washington College and even having his abode there was really the best you could have hoped for under those circumstances and again, it shows that uh, I just want to read this segment regarding duty as a fundamental aspect to Lee, and it's the last segment I'm going to read from Freeman. The road from Arlington, though lit with glory, led straight to Appomattox, but Lee never regretted his action. With the war behind him, with the South desolate and disenfranchised, and with her sons dead on a hundred battlefields, he was to look back with a soul unshaken and say, I did only what my duty demanded. I could have taken no other course without dishonor. And if it were to be done all over again, I should have acted in precisely the same manner. You can almost say that that is an entirely fatalistic conception, but you can also say that it is also consistent with a Christian conception that providence has determined it such. And despite all of the implications and the loss of life, if he was going to fulfill his duty, he was going to commit to that with the utmost of his industry and ability, which is what he did. And you can say the ultimate effects of that were, despite the character and the legacy of Lee, was, as you say, the prolonging and intensification of a conflict that could have been resolved in a span of 18 months.
Yeah, sorry. I was looking uh, for a particular passage from the first volume on Arlington as well. <clears throat> it's worth noting since we're, we're talking about the confiscation. Um, he had written early in the war um, about Arlington um, to one of his relatives, one of the female relatives, I believe. And he mentioned that, uh, you know, he would uh, rather have seen it burned to the ground than in the hands of its occupiers. But then he almost immediately recanted that and wrote another le le a letter sort of, uh, you know, retracting his, his wrath, you know, sort of viewing it as sim as sinful and basically wishing well to whoever happened to occupy Arlington. You know, he, that this was the view he always took. We can also say that uh, Mrs. Lee attempted to get back her great grandmother's property. That is relics of George Washington, you know, just not particularly valuable things, but just literally like his pants, um, which uh, the was actually countermanded by the federal government and George Washington's property remained outside of the Lee family. And, you know, Mr. Lee himself, again, simply hoped that the, the people who came to possess it simply understood its significance. And it, it uh, you know, um, sort of uh, gave them an attitude of um, respect for the traditions of the country. So, I mean, e even uh, this gets us to today, you know, thinking about what, what Mr. Lee would think about the current situation in Arlington, the destruction of his statue. I mean, the, the, the man is so practically saintly. Um, I hate to even use that word to describe him, but I mean, it's it's hard to really describe his character in any other way. I mean, it's hard to imagine Lee even being wrathful towards the people currently besmirching, um, you know, the grave of his horse, uh, his property and all of this. It, it really is quite remarkable, uh, the character of this man. And again, that's, you can say, the ultimate contradiction that here, the voice of post-war reconciliation is also the leading figure for the dissolution of the Union at the same time. But if you understand Lee's personality, these two disparate views are entirely consistent. And you can say his attitude towards the destruction of his statues would probably be the same, that if some greater goal were served by the destruction of his statues, then his humility would permit that slight on his legacy. They're not necessarily of what his legacy would come to represent in terms of being beyond him and that of the... Again, I mentioned this at the beginning regarding my overall perception of this, but I, I don't consider Lee as a defender of Southern separatism. That should be readily apparent to everyone, but I view him as the defender of the antique America the America that existed between 1776 and, 1880, and 1861, what we'd refer to as antebellum, but as I've tried to delineate with the planter culture, with Washington, with Jefferson, something which is more in keeping with the Virginia-centric conception of what the United States was originally founded as. Um, and he, in addition to what you can say as his personal sort of virtue, does represent that perfect heroic picture of a southern knight or a southern aristocrat and for better or worse many other people try to imitate that legacy of course you know people will question why we don't bring up things like the Ku Klux Klan and the veneration of the Lee monument on Stone Mountain etc and that's certainly an undeniable element of it but completely divorced from all political context if you just look at Lee himself removed from all the political baggage that he comes associated with indeed the implications of the prolonging of the confederacy to the defense of slavery all of this becomes it's, it's almost the world is almost in complete contradiction versus lee and his personality and his own sense of duty versus everything that has become associated with him which is why i find his military genius as you mentioned earlier rather less interesting compared to the effects of the lost cause and something I really wasn't expecting when going into the historiography, which is the nuance regarding the lost cause. I mean, first of all, you can say the lost cause was a, a response to reconstruction, an unintended response to reconstruction, where it was essentially assertion of a Southern identity against Northern occupation, one that was allowed to come into being after 1877. And we have the compromise there that allowed Hayes to be president but essentially allowed the Democrats to be somewhat reconciled both in the South and then in the North when I think Grover Cleveland became president. During that time, we have many sort of monuments associations. And of course, the most prominent of this is Monument Avenue in Richmond, where 
the Richmond Lee statue was established in 1890s, early 20th century, and was recently removed as of, I believe, 2020, 2021. Even the plinth has been removed since then. But aspects like that also show how Lee was able to be recontextualized as a national icon. And it's predicated again on what I've been advocating regarding his Virginia particularism and his own conception of fighting for the Constitution. This is also something that Eisenhower uh, wish to emphasize when it came to his own defense of the military record of Lee and attempting to rehabilitate him in his own image. Um, to the South, he was obviously a hero of Virginia independence, but to the North, he could be representative of those aspects of, you can say, humility, Christian virtue, and also one of the best generals the United States has ever produced. I mean, you know, I really can't think of a general who is Lee's equal just by looking at my my flirtation with American military history. I just can't see it. And when we have the 1900s again, we see the publishing of Lee's letters and recollections, uh, which does wonders, I think, to rehabilitate his image based on his own personal letters. By the 1820s, when we have the Roaring Twenties moving into the, um, uh, the Great Depression, there is a huge revival in interest of antebellum America because antebellum America is associated with some form of rural idyll compared to the devastation wrought as a result of the depression. And that's why we have books such as Only Yesterday, which in 1931, I believe it was released, was essentially a, um, a social history of the South, which was very much to its favor. Then we see films like Gone with the Wind. There's also something I really need to do, which was I've been inspired by this film to finally do, which is uh, Sit Down and uh, read uh, William Faulkner's uh, Absalom, Absalom, which pertains to the South. I, I really haven't read it before, but I feel compelled to do it now. Um, all of these facts sort of go back to this idea that Lee was able to encapsulate an element of the South which could be rehabilitated, g given, you can say, the unimpeachable personal legacy that he offered, especially in contrast to the most egregious Union commander, in this case would be Sherman, and the defense of private property versus the elimination of private property. There is also something else I really want to bring in regarding Lee's legacy, because we've talked consistently, Charlemagne, about the disparity of resources, the fact that the Confederacy was outgunned, outmanned, and ultimately outmaneuvered. And indeed, it never received foreign recognition that would have been vital if the Confederacy was ever going to maintain independence. In 1862 and 1863, there was a distant possibility that France may have come to recognize the Confederacy. Um, that would have been Emperor Napoleon III, and that would have completely get, changed the game. And from Napoleon III's point of view, that would have also meant his conquest of Mexico could have gone ahead without the implications that happened later on. But regarding the specific aspect of industrialization, that is something else that comes out of the early 20th century historiography regarding Lee, is that Lee's campaign was doomed because he was fighting against industrialization. He was fighting for a rural aristocratic conception of America against, you can say, Yankee industry and commerce and what would later become the Rockefellers and the Carnegies and the rule of the magnates in America in the late 19th century. In many ways, the veneration of Lee was to represent some sort of antithesis of that. And I, I've, I've read Tom Shippey. This may be a weird tangent for a stream on Lee, but Tom Shippey is, was um, a paramount, I oh, was still alive, I think, <laughs> is a paramount Tolkien scholar, uh, probably the most famous one there is. And in his book, I believe it was The Author of the Century, he talks about Tolkien's possible inspirations for the writing of the Shire. The Shire, of course, which is representative of a hobbit uh, rural idyll in contrast to the uh, horrific machinations of an Angband or a Mordor. And he took, ostensibly as one of his inspirations, Virginia and West Virginia. And I never really understood that until doing this stream. Because if you look at the lost cause of the Confederacy in terms of competing economic systems and social conceptions, and indeed you can say in Lee's case, a desire to fulfill one's duty and maintain one's fidelity to one's conscience and one's sense of providence, 
then looking to Antebellum Virginia would actually be a logical case of looking to inspiration for something like Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Um, and really, if you look at the conflict in Lord of the Rings as a conflict between ruralism and industrialization, uh, you can say that is very much repeated here. But the fascinating thing about the historiography of this period is that I'm really not offering anything really original in terms of my assessment here. All of this has been said. And I think what I found so frustrating in doing all of this research for this stream is the sheer poverty of the understanding of Lee and the cause of Virginia. I, I hate to even say the cause of the Confederacy because I believe that it is the cause of Virginia, Virginia centralism, and the conception of the United States with Virginia at its heart, which is why I believe the legacy of the Confederacy is far more dangerous to the subsequent history of the Union as representing an alternative form of America, as opposed to a very localized aspect of separatism. And I'm going to leave it there. Yes, I mean, the, the Confederacy really should never have existed. It came out, uh, I mean, it's just a military alliance when it comes down to it. And it, it shouldn't be mytholo bleh, sorry, mythologized in Southern history because it really is one of the worst parts of our history. I mean, it's it's interesting to think, to think again about Lee's perspective. I mean, his idea was that the war settled the question as to whether or not the Union was perpetual. After the war, um, you know, he... Um, asserted wholeheartedly that that it had been decided that the union was an inseparable, inviolable um, pact, and he did believe though that states should have equal and full rights under the Constitution. Um, so he wasn't um, a you know hardcore centralist. Uh, he he believed in states' rights, but underneath the union. And I really enjoyed the biography um, because it it. It helped demythologize Lee because the um, Southall Freeman biography is really just about Lee as the man, and because it's written in the 1930s, you don't have the you know next nearly hundred years of um, mythologizing attached to him. That's that's frankly just very wrong in terms. Of well, which you know, you know the irony is actually I, I would say that Freeman's book comes at a perfect time in terms yes, of the because the, it's before the, the mid century. It's uh, before the mid century, and it's after the excessive mythologizing it comes in that window of time where there have been so many perspectives offered on lee that he's able to achieve a symbiosis between all of those countervailing perspectives whereas if it had been written for i mean even looking at my more recent books such as um connolly which is i think written in the 1970s I, I think he can only get away with doing a historiographical review by being faintly hostile to lee throughout the uh um, the whole tone of the book. But nevertheless, I think Freeman, I mean, this really is a seminal work in terms of trying to understand its impact on history. I mean, I, I, I despise Winston Churchill, but regardless in terms of the literary feat of the biography, when Winston Churchill visited the United States, I think it was in 1946, uh, one of the people he wanted to meet was Douglas Southall Freeman for his magisterial work on uh, on the biography of Lee. Because, uh, again, another implication of the lost cause, I mean, you, you basically talked about the sainted person of Lee, and that is very much based on his fundamental decency, which, again, I believe at the moment is something that has to be destroyed. That element of him has to be completely associated with the legacy of slavery, because if one is to look at the man, one is going to find that this image is fundamentally more complex, and you can say one can feel sympathy for his point of view, which would be impossible if he was going to reduce his legacy entirely down to that of slavery. But the other extreme is to say that Lee was a peerless, superlative, blameless commander whose faults can be blamed on all of his junior officers, um, which is part of the extremes that come out in the 1880s. I mean, there was also a dynastic reason for the protection of the Lee dynasty. After Lee died, Washington College was taken over by one of his sons. Uh, Fitzhugh Lee and Rooney were great sort of myth builders in terms of the Lee legacy. And um, of the Lee generals, General Early was again a great promoter of the uh, mythology of Lee. And a lot of this became very politically heated, especially after he died, because Longstreet was blamed for the various defeats of Lee, especially that of Gettysburg. 
because not not only was Longstreet obviously, as we've said, insubordinate, but we've also said that was an implication of Lee himself <coughs> and his style of command. But it's because Longstreet became a Republican after the war. And during a time of radical reconstruction, to essentially become a Republican was almost to be seen as a traitor to the Southern cause. And so Longstreet was twice damned. He was a traitor to the North, and now he was a traitor to the, the cause of the Confederacy as well. So attacks on Longstreet and the veneration of Lee were very much focus of political attacks after this. And indeed, Jefferson Davis, you know, who lived beyond Lee, um, and narrowly avoided being imprisoned and put on trial for treason, thanks to Johnson's uh, uh, grant of uh, pardon and amnesty, uh, was against this idea of the mythologizing of Lee because Davis was a believer in Southern separatism, whereas Lee, as we said otherwise, complicates that view. But what I like about Freeman and indeed many other or recent historians, military historians, is the focus on Lee's lieutenants, the fact that this was very much a collaborative effort, and Lee provided that overall strategy and leadership and was able to extract the best from various officers. However, when it comes to Gettysburg, that whole philosophy is completely thrown out of the window as bizarre, and that is the great anomaly in his career. Yes, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Prudentialist had read Lee and his generals, I believe, and I was hoping that he would be able to thus get us more into Lee's lieutenants. You know, perhaps in the future we could do another five-hour stream on uh, Lee's uh, generals. That would be interesting in its own right. I think um, now might be a good time to to bring up this the short quote. Um, the uh, you know out of the entire four-volume set, this one quote really stood out to me on page two hundred two in the fourth volume. This is Lee uh, addressing Beauregard on patriotism, and he says, True patriotism sometimes requires of men to act exactly contrary at one period to that which it does at another, and the motive which impels them, the desire to do right, is precisely the same. The circumstances which govern their actions change, and their conduct must conform to the new order of things. History is full of illustrations of this. Washington himself is an example. At one time, he fought against the French under Braddock in the service of the King of Great Britain. At another, he fought with the French at Yorktown under the orders of the Continental Congress of America against him. He has not been branded by the word which, with, he has not been branded by the world with reproach for this, but his course has been applauded. Um, I think that's interesting because Lee is very non-ideological and everything we see since Lee, I mean, people are, this conception, I, I think, of patriotism is very at odds with how people tend to, to view it today, and even others at its time, that's obviously what he's addressing, but people are just so ideological. Uh, Lee doesn't really see things that way. He has, he has a set of principles that drives him, not some sort of ideological commitment to, to this or that cause in perpetuity, and I think that's a really uh, useful and interesting um, outlook, and you know, I wanted to mention, too, just in terms of his mythology, it kind of goes both ways. Like, you know, we have modern secessionist movements in the United States and, you know, people might use the image of Lee or the Confederacy in that. I mean, when you when you look at Lee and what he believed about the Union, it's really difficult for me to imagine how he could possibly uh, believe that secessionism in the, the 21st century uh, would be the correct course of action, which I think is an interesting contrast to how he's sort of abused. I mean, I think he's abused by both sides, so to speak, um, really in all quarters of our society at this point. And, I, you know, reading this biography biography by uh, Southall Freeman has really sort of uh, uh, recontextualized Lee appropriately. You used the word complex earlier. I think his Lee's complexity only really comes from the, uh, you know, more than a century of... Um, ideological um, baggage that has been attached to him in the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. In reality, as, as Freeman eulogizes Lee in the final chapter, you know, he makes the point that Lee is re Lee is um, he's simple and spiritual. He's a simple man. He was a spiritual man. And when you get down to the core of his character, um, there's actually very little complexity. And I think that's why, you know, 
partially why you know he was just so consistent throughout his life is because he didn't he he at no point in his life had these complex views he had this very pure of heart um way of living and yeah i'll pass it to you no i i think that that if anything it buttresses the point that the complexity is simply the position in which he occupied the person himself is actually as both of us try to illustrate rather straightforward you can anticipate his actions and you can rationalize all of his political views and i only mean political views in terms of you can almost say as an aspect of military strategy he didn't like politicians he didn't like politicians getting involved in military affairs he hated political appointees he was albeit frustrated with the state of the confederate congress yet at the same time he never sought to take control of political affairs by placing the government of the confederacy under military control um which is all the more interesting the last thing i want to bring up is something that we have to talk about because this is what actually prompted this stream but i think it's been a wonderful opportunity to have this stream because we've done a lot of the heavy lifting <laughs> i suppose for people who want something like an appraisal which isn't going to pander to either the extremes of uh confederate fetishization or denigration as part of the construct of white supremacism and slavery i think We've done a good job here of trying to find a appreciable way of actually understanding Lee within the broad context of American history. But the stream was prompted by the destruction of the bronze statue of Lee from formerly from Charlottesville. And we can only anticipate that that is going to be a similar fate visited on the Richmond statue. The only thing I'm I'm hoping won't happen really, uh, other than seeing this as destruction of these works of art to say to say nothing of the implications of what the statues supposedly represent, is that the university chapel, Lee's chapel and place of interment is not vandalized or wrecked during the uh, ensuing years. If there's going to be one sort of sanctuary, I mean, the reason I'm thinking about that is looking to what happened to Franco recently who was disinterned from the Valley of the Fallen, which was the great monument to Franco's victory as a result of the Spanish Civil War. Franco won that war, and yet his body was still disinterned from the Valley of the Fallen. So I'm wondering how long Lee is going to escape that fate as well, and what horrors are going to await his body. But anyway, I wanted to hear your perspective on the destruction of the statues before we go to the Super Chats. It doesn't, um, I don't find myself particularly goaded by it. I mean, obviously it's disgusting. I, I suppose I take a similar approach as uh, Mr. Lee may have as well. I mean, they can destroy all the statues they want. Um, I think, again, if we want to reference the hand of Providence, as you placed on the screen, I mean, the destruction of the statue has taken a statue that few will ever lay eyes on and turned it into a new form a new symbol that previously didn't exist that perhaps is much more powerful than the statue itself ever could hope to be. So, you know, perhaps uh, the, the recompense of such wanton destruction has already been um, reaped by those who uh, undertook the effort and were foolish enough to film it and present it to the world. I mean, they can destroy all the statues they want. Um, you know, Lee himself uh, initially didn't even really, uh, I don't think Lee ever actually supported. He he didn't support uh, putting up specific monuments to Confederates. Um, although, given the treatment of the dead, he did support the creation of Confederate cemeteries so that they would be properly buried. Lee himself would would not look fondly upon these statues to him. Um, you know, overall, again, they can they can try to destroy these uh, physical symbols of. Um, the confederacy or whatever they believe they represent which you know that statue certainly doesn't um but you know it represents mr lee himself the man you know in my view but you know they can destroy all the statues they want um you know these are just atoms and molecules they can't sorry i think you've cut out there hello Okay, I think we've we've lost Charlemagne. Um, until he comes back, hello. Uh, did I cut out? 
Yes, you did. Okay, well, I'm back. <laughs> we, uh, we've gone on for so long. My uh, battery has run out of power, but that's Okay. Um, all right, all right. I'll, I'll get. Anyway, I'll get I, I think you heard that's... everything I said there, pretty much. That's yes. Um, well, I I can restore my uh connection easily, but I I think you got to the. I think you heard every pretty much everything I said there. But uh, yeah, just in case you missed the last sentence or so, you mean they can destroy all the statues they want, all the monuments they want. You know, blast the face of Stone Mountain. It, it doesn't matter. They can't ever destroy the 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 history itself, or the um. Or, or the spirit, right? So it, it doesn't matter. I mean, go ahead. Go ahead and wantedly exhibit, um, you, you know, your evil in front of everybody. You know, it, it all it could possibly do is, uh, you know, empower those who think and act rightly. So I'm going to well, go all and... I, uh... <laughs> all, I'm go, all I'm going to say, uh, Charlemagne, is that this whole stream only exists because of that image, effectively. Um it provided ample motivation for i think both of us to do this and if that you know is the side effect of all this then ultimately that's a positive effect you know, i feel i have a much better understanding of american history after having done this and it definitely isn't the american history that the iconoclasts have wanted to present so in many senses you can take that as defeat all right moving on to the super chats Bolero393 for uh, $10. Doesn't matter to the people shoving General Lee's statue in that furnace, whether you descended from Lee Forrest or even John Brown. They're waiting for the day they can push us in with him. Yes, and that's obviously the implication. I mean, what I find most insidious is that Lee is fundamentally inspirational. And not only are you destroying the association, I mean, like I said, I believe it more as a Virginian nationalist and as representative of a antique America, as representing a genuinely aristocratic spirit, as, as sorry, representing the best elements of plantation, of planter culture, which of course were not consistently apply throughout the South. There were egregious examples, but he was very much the best example. In terms of the destruction of an icon, the destruction of a man, I find it thoroughly reprehensible. And the idea is to kill all of these positive role models and leave us all in some sort of futile, miserable stupor. Um, but as we can see, that isn't the effect that it's had on either me or Charlemagne. I hope people listening. Uh, Hitman for five pounds uh when we take over a new lee statue needs to be built preferably it'll be huge and golden like the genghis khan statue of mongolia uh, again as charlemagne's iterated i'm thoroughly against that position i mean i'm more invested in the lee statue in terms of the attacks on lee's memory as the statues i almost see it as destructions of works of art and they are, they're very impressive statues. And this is a consequence of a revolutionary anti-white iconoclasm. You know, that's obvious, that's all there is to it. But I don't think the example is to do what they've done in Uzbekistan and what they've done in Ulaanbaatar, which is to venerate monsters like Tamerlane and like Genghis Khan. You know, if, if there has to be a statue built to Lee or built to any of those people, it will be built to the person who wouldn't want a statue of himself, <laughs> which ironically was Lee. So no, I mean, there's one way of taking a national icon who isn't morally reprehensible like Lee. And then there's taking it to the other extreme where you build vast statues to perpetrators of legitimate genocide like Tamerlane and Genghis Khan. I mean, if there's going to be a corrective, that's going to be as horrific as the situation we're in now. Uh, El Cid Leon for five dollars. Uh, bringing outlander slaves into America is just simply wrong because it taints civilization. Now we're on the path to Haiti. Well, that really is an irrelevant comment when it comes to here. I mean, Lee, as it pertains to Lee, Lee believed that it was an evil situation upon which Southern society was saddled. He simply didn't want the destruction of society and of providentially determined order um, to ensure that uh, slavery was abolished, 
in that sense, he was a conservative with a small c, a Burkean, and a man who wasn't necessarily determined by ideology, but determined by faith. Um, as for that situation, I actually don't believe we're on to something like Haiti in America, because for obvious reasons, um, uh, black separatism in America has never actually been successfully tried. Um, think and repent for four dollars has just sent a a coffee mug. Well, thank you very much. Uh, C one two three for two dollars. Uh, God bless Robert E Lee. Uh, absolutely, and thank you. Uh, Rory Vaisley for ten dollars. Uh, Dio Vinci. Thank you very much. Uh, Faith Knight for ten dollars. Really enjoyed the stream and the cogent insight you both presented into the life of one of my favorite historical figures. Lee is a paragon of Southern nobility and his character worthy of emulation. Absolutely. I think, I mean, a lot of people, because I'm a, I'm not really a Habsburg simp, actually. I'm far more critical of the Habsburgs than a lot of quote unquote Habsburg simps that um, I'm surrounded with. In fact, I'm very much against Habsburg simpery, but the figure for that side of things is very much uh, Emperor Karl uh, of Austria, who was emperor between 1916 and 1918. But I find Lee is, uh, and I have been inspired from researching this. I wasn't really effect, uh, expecting this uh, had to have such an effect on me, but it has um, far more of an effect than the image you can see on the right. So I would very much echo those sentiments. Um, Charlemagne, do you have anything to say? Yes, uh, my, my experience reading the biography is downright biblical. Um, I highly recommend uh, everyone read the, the South Hall Freeman biography um, in full if you have time. I mean, I'm sure the abridged version is also excellent, but uh, I was really surprised that, you know, upon concluding um, the volumes, uh, just the, the profound effect it had and, and the strong desire I feel to, as he said, emulate his character. So I think merely Lee, I mean, my, I had, I had, a, I had the thought in my head uh, reading the book um, that, you know, if, if Robert E. Lee didn't make it through the gates of heaven, then certainly none of us have any chance. Um, it, you know, I think reading the biography will have a profound effect on your life and hopefully better your character. Wiggles for two pounds. Uh, thank you for the great stream, AM. Well, thank you very much for the super chat. And the eccentric tripper for five dollars. Great stream as always, AM. Uh, what are the chances we could get a after hour stream on what if Lee marched on Richmond? Um, I, I can't do an after hour stream because my alternative history streams aren't really alternative history streams, they're counterfactuals. And there is no counterfactual I can conceive in which Lee would have marched on Richmond due to everything that we've said. Um, so the answer is no. Um, in fact, I think what has been quite sort of useful with this stream is that we've gone over, I think, all of the counterfactuals that could have existed um, in terms of exhausting sort of possible avenues for that. I, I'm not qualified to do it on the Civil War era. Uh, it'll have to affect some sort of other period of American history. And even then, I don't feel qualified to talk about this. Um, I feel constantly humbled to be surrounded by so many erudite Americans. And uh, I feel it's uh, an act of heresy in many ways that I'm the one hosting this stream. But uh, <laughs> there it is. It was surprising, but I'm, I'm very glad because, like I said before, um, you know, I was uh, shamefully undereducated on the, the Civil War and, and Lee. So you provided the opportunity if nothing else, uh, to me for that. And I guess just on the comment, as I suggested before, you know, maybe if we have time for it, we could do a separate and shorter stream, just um, getting into more detail on some of the battles and the generals, uh, because the Prudentialist, I think, did read more on that. Um, so, you know, I hope I have, um, I hope I've done an admirable, admirable job. Um, I wasn't planning on discussing the details of the battles um, entirely on my own as much, but uh you know, this was a lot of information to take in in basically just a two-week period. I mean, the only... Uh, I, I mean, there there is a channel who's done this. He's called um, uh, Thersites the Historian. But, I mean, I hate to say this, but, you know, he's a he's an unrepentant leftist. So, um, 
uh, maybe that's something we we may have to do. But um, I'm not I'm not a military historian, so I'm I'm just not sure about that. Well, I just meant more getting into the character and his just more into the generals uh, in particular, um, as they are they are mentioned throughout the book. But you can only really commit so much to memory in one go, so it might be worth looking at his lieutenants more. Just a suggestion, but looks like you have another super chat in. Uh, people still remember Lee in Virginia, despite the fault near Richmond being renamed Greg Adams. Oh, for goodness sake. Uh, almost everyone still calls it Fort Lee. And I mean, you just have to laugh at that. You just have to see that as an act of absolute petty vindictiveness. There's nothing more to it. And again, people who would never have even thought about considering what Fort Lee meant are now more invested in the concept of a name which has a, you know an avenue or a place or a statue which represents him or has his name on than would have ever been the case um, had it not been for these, I don't know, ridiculous acts of self-defeating iconoclasm, uh, which indeed I think have had a tangible effect in destroying the possibility of recruitment uh, for Southern white boys to join the US Army. And now they're reaping what they've sown in that regard. And <laughs> uh, it will be interesting to see how they rescue that situation. But uh, destroying the memory of people like Robert E. Lee, who would actually help you as a national icon in this, it certainly seems to be self-defeating among many other things that uh, the enemies of Lee are currently doing. All right. It's been a very long stream, but uh, I think well worth the effort. Charlemagne. Is there anything you would like to say or shill before we finally get out of here? Uh, I am recording uh, a film review of Cape Fear with Last Things as soon as I sign off here. In fact, I'm a little late to that, um, but uh, you know, I'm chatting with him now. So yeah, go check out Last Things um, Film Review Festival. Um, it's been, um, well, I'll say it's been excellent, although I haven't watched any of it yet because I've been reading these biographies, but I'm about to do my review with him on the the uh, De Niro and Scorsese version of Cape Fear. And then other than that, uh, obviously go check out uh, my uh, friends at the old Glory Club Substack and YouTube channel um, who have been uh, shilling this stream. And obviously those fellows have a great interest in this topic as well. Uh, so yeah, thank you for having me on. And it has been absolutely wonderful to have you on. Indeed, it has been essential to have you on. I don't feel I could have done the topic without an American. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you so much, Charlemagne. Thank you everyone who has listened to this stream. Um, thank you everyone who gave a super chat. Remember to like, leave a comment, subscribe. And if you want to help with the work of this channel, very much appreciate people who want to become members. All right. Good night.